Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The sparkle of fire is the witness of your word. Amen. The silence friends of the Thank water you. is the witness of your softness. The rising of the sun you, in the sir. east and the, the sunset sparkle of in the fire west is the witness of, of your word. Amen. The silence friends of the Thank water you. is the witness of your softness. Of the moon is the witness of your perfection. Keeping the rhythm in mind, let's join for our university song. Just a second.
Have you ever tried understanding a subject to a song? I'm sure no one will have. Let's let us open the doors to this one of understanding statistics through statistics jingle. Am I audible? Hello. No. Yes, yes. Opportunity to invite the pride of our Department of Statistics, a one-woman army who single-handedly handles the administration of our department and who never lets her students feel disappointed. Dr. Jyoti Shivalkar, ma'am, the head of Department of Statistics, Hislop College, Nagpur, to deliver her words of wisdom to us. Thank you, Ria. Um, Good morning, one and all. I think I'm I am I audible? <laughs> So, good morning, one and all. Today's guest of honor, Dr. Gogle, other invited guest speakers, Dr. Gore and Dr. Mahadik, our principal, Dr. Sheke, our vice principals, Dr. Yoel and Dr. Pratik Michael, teacher participants in this workshop, and my dear student participants. Today, we are all here for the inaugural session of Statistica 2021. This is a workshop. We are, I am happy to share with you that this is the 25th year of Statistica 2021. Means from 25 years, we are celebrating Statistica at our department. And I am happy that this is the 25th year of our annual two-day workshop Statistica, which we both, Dr. Vrinda Zogoykar and I, uh, had started long back, say 25 years back in Hislop College. We started this workshop uh, of statistics uh, with an objective to make students aware of applications of statistics in real life and to popularize the subject. So we developed many innovative com competitions like StatSmart project presentation competition, StatStar problem solving competition, StatMaze puzzle, and Statistica uh, StatStorm quiz also was a part of this workshop. This StatStorm quiz 
is a statistics quiz. And we conducted this workshop Statistica as our annual activity consistently, sometimes at the intra-college intra level, sometimes at the inter-college level. And we conducted it at state level thrice. The event gained popularity and we were invited at Amravati uh, twice and in Aurangabad, Government College of uh, uh, Arts and Commerce to conduct this Statistica for their students. It has been a pleasure for us to develop new stat star, uh, new stat star every time, stat maze, etc. All these competitions, we develop the stat stat maze. I think I have developed, and uh, with the help of uh, uh, we both developed, rather than the Zogaykar madam and I, we develop at least 20 stat maze till till this uh, event. And every time we derive the pleasure, pleasure. It has been a tradition of my department to conduct the student centric programs only. This tradition continued in the pandemic period also. The stat may stat star were transformed to a new online mode. Today, we all will witness new online innovative competitions which will introduce students to the real world of statistics and will expand their statistics knowledge boundaries further. I am thankful to Gore sir for his and motivation. I acknowledge the uh, prayer offered by Dr. Ajayuel. Thank you, sir. And I have kept one uh, I, one story, one session as my story session, just because this is a student workshop. And in my story session, Mr. Samad, Mr. Samadhan Gubade, a young dynamic statistician, is sharing his success story. I think that his story will motivate the whole students. And uh, we are presenting some case studies. Uh, the case studies will be presented by Hislop College students and it proved to be a good exercise for them in handling the real life data. In this workshop, we are also releasing a book, Do It Yourself, an activity book, which is authored by Dr. Vrinda Zogaikar and I. And it is a book for activity book for UG students of statistics. We've, we thought that this is this being a UG workshop, UG student workshop. It is a good time to release this book and we are releasing that book at the hands of our most inspiring teacher, Professor Rao Madam. And I'm thankful to Rao Madam for accepting our invitation to release the book. I'm not a one woman army because I have got a full fleet of very competent student or soldiers. And I'm calling them soldiers because they are really soldiers. They are fighting on all, fighting on all fronts. Like uh, two students, they, they were they, they they are not well they are sick but remaining eight students they manage their role and i'm happy that even those two students are present today for this workshop and that's why i'm saying that i'm not a one woman army and without these competent students without these competent soldiers i am incomplete and i'm sure that most of them will be commanding statistics uh, command commanders of statistics tomorrow so as a convener of this workshop, I'm happy to share with you that there are 380 students registered for from Chennai, Bangalore, Vadodara, Solapur, Ahmadnagar, Jalgaon, Nasik, Raurkela, Pune, Mumbai, Chandigarh, Srinagar, and of course from Nagpur. And 35 to 40 teacher participants also are uh, have registered. Uh, to accommodate all these students and teachers, we are streaming the program live on YouTube to uh, and, and the YouTube sh link is shared with all the groups. So I thank one and all here present here and expect that the workshop will be a nice memorable experience to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your enlightening words. A good teacher and monitor can inspire hope, ignite the imagination, and instill a learn of learning. With this quote, I would like to request our principal sir to guide us with his words. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Shinivas Bhogle, uh, Dr. Anil Gore and Dr. Shashi Bhushan Maharik, participants for uh, Statistica 2021, my colleague at Islop College and dear friends. 
a warm welcome to all of you. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of Islop Education Society for Statistica 2021, scheduled today and tomorrow. Physical sciences always been the fundamental technology in modern times. Application of these sciences have been channelized into core area which have helped greatly in forecasting the shape of things to come. This workshop is aimed at providing a platform for platform for building up the future prospects and discovering new avenues for conducting research. It is a tradition of this department to conduct statistics annually to highlight the application of statistics and to popularize the subject. I congratulate the statistics department and especially Dr. Jyoti Shivalkar, the head of the statistics department for organizing this workshop at the national level for more than 380 students, participants from all over the nation and teachers of statistics. I am very happy that eminent statisticians like Dr. Srinivas Bogle, Dr. Anil Gore, Dr. I welcome them and equally I am thankful to them. Workshop Statistica will provide students opportunity for setting their future goals. And I am sure that the workshop will be informative, some experience for the students as well as the teacher's audience. I hereby convey my best wishes to the workshop and her organizing student team. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind words and also for providing us with such an opportunity to, to roll ourselves in the pool of this amazing workshop. I feel honored and privileged to introduce our guest for this startlingly beautiful morning, Dr. Srinivas Bogle. I hereby invite Master Atharva Khod to be first about Thank you, Ria. Today, we are lucky to have among us, us some of the greatest minds in the field of statistics. These luminaries do not need any introduction, but a very formal introduction is a requirement. We start with Dr. Srinivas Bhogle. Dr. Bhogle started his trees with statistics in 1973 at Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, probably the best institute in India. Then he did his bachelor's as BSTAT and master's as MSTAS from ISI Calcutta and specialized in information system and analytics. Bhogle sir completed MSTAT in 1980 and went abroad for his PhD the same year. He joined University of Paris and completed his PhD in three years, where his core subjects were graphs and hypergraphs. Sir finished his PhD in 1983 and in March 1984, he joined National Aerospace Laboratories Bangalore as the head of information management division. Bhogle sir served the company for almost 22 years till September 2006. The next two years, he was Vice President Analytics with Crane Software Private Limited till November 2008. Sir has worked as Director and India Country Manager for six years. He has been December 2008 to March 2017. Currently, Sir is working as an Honorary Scientist at CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute, India. He is also a sought-after independent consultant in analytics and information systems. The list of his work and achievement is too long. I will cite a few of prominence. Dr. Bhogle has done monsoon rainfall prediction using data-intensive techniques. He has taught course in big data analytics at St. Joseph's College. He has partnered in a project to blog and written a book on agile software development. He has been a management consultant on how to manage small software development companies. He is an outstanding speaker and can build stories with complex statistics with ease and make it pa uh, palatable for his students and audience. He has guided over 200 student projects in database design and information systems, 
and is the author of about 75 published articles, reviews, and reports. Today, he will address us on topic argumentum, how to infer from data. It is really honor to have you today, sir. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. I would like to request, sir, to please take up the platform and enlighten us with his notes on argumentum, how to infer data. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling me. Let me start right away because uh, yeah, we have time till 11 o'clock, so I'd rather spend that time, you know, talking. So I'm going to share my screen now. Sir, you can continue for 40 minutes even. OK, thank you. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. OK, so I do hope that you can see my first slide. In case you can't, please tell me. Yes, sir, it's visible. Yeah. All right, so the title for today's talk is okay. Argumentum is some, I think it's a Greek or Latin word, but essentially we're going to talk about how to infer from data. Essentially about how we could draw inferences from data, which is really what statistics is all about. I must thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be sitting through this session already. It was especially enthralling to listen to that song. Statistics is for everyone's use. How very true is that? Indeed, it reminds me of undoubtedly the premier statistician of our country, Professor Prashanto Chandra Mahalanobish, who founded the Indian Statistical Institute back in 1931 or 32. And he was really the first person I know in India and amongst the few in the world who realized that we can use statistics as a key technology in the solution of you know everyday problems. It's just not like take some data, take some numbers and draw some graphs. Uh, it is it is really a very powerful and viable tool to solve problems and sort of improve humanity, mankind, whatever you like. And what we have seen over the years is that what he foresaw is absolutely right. And especially in the last 10, 15 years with the what you might say the coming of big data and so on, statistics has suddenly, you know, is on everyone's lips. In the past, it used to be in sort of one corner of a college somewhere. Now statistics is out there wide in the open. Everyone's using it. Everyone is awed by statistics. Everyone is mighty impressed by its potential and everyone is excited by its many applications. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about a lot of examples. There's going to be no theories. So let me move on to the first. OK, so every time you've got to give a talk, you know, one of the challenges is that you got to organize it. It should look sort of it should look like a talk. There should be something to hold the talk together. So I was wondering what that could be. And I eventually decided that given this theme, why not think of a jigsaw puzzle? We've all seen jigsaw puzzles. Some of us must be fascinated and great, uh, you know, enjoy jigsaw puzzles. If you look at jigsaw puzzles, and that's what you can see, really we can think of data in a somewhat similar fashion. On the extreme left, you see this uh, jigsaw puzzle, which is complete which means that obviously all these were little pieces, but all of us could put those pieces together correctly and see a picture, uh, which really means that the data that we have fits perfectly. All you need is some intelligence, a sense of deduction uh, to be able to put it together. So it's, it's almost like solving a mystery. It's almost like you know Sherlock Holmes is to come back. So that's one kind of data. So I look at some examples of situations where the data fits perfectly. Then I look at examples where there is missing data. There is a story. There's some truth. There's some discovery to be made, but uh, yeah, we don't have the building blocks. All yes, the pieces. Sir, sorry to interrupt. Can you yeah. please add the presentation? The, you're not able. To, you're not able to see it, is it? No, we. I'm able to, but it's not in the presentation mode. OK, OK, you just want me to expand that. All right, all right, I'll do that. Yeah. Better now. Sir, you have to means uh, for to show the presentation on full screen, you have to share your complete screen, not a window of PowerPoint. OK, yeah, I see that, but uh, I think the screen is big enough, right? No, sir, it's in the edit editing mode. Yeah, sir, it's now. Now it's in the full screen. Uh, it's the full screen now, so all right, so let's continue. Yeah, so the other example we have is of, uh, I mean, the jigsaw puzzle is incomplete. 
Uh, it can be effectively completed. Maybe we don't have all the pieces, but there are ways and techniques of completing that. So we look at some examples. So what do we have to do here? Here we've got to essentially use models, design or device experiments or do some simulations. So yeah, so we look at that. Uh, and and the last the last example is and it's ironical. We wouldn't have talked of this example, say 15 years ago, that there is too much data. You know, in the past we already had situations where there wasn't enough data. The classical statistical approach of solving problems would be, you know, run a questionnaire or go gather some data, do some field work, you know, put it all together. And that was the stuff. So we always there was a scarcity of data. And in some sense, we had sufficiently many techniques to use this data and to sort of infer from this data. So the problem really was not the tool. The problem was the data. And today we are exactly at the opposite end of that spectrum because the problem is there's too much data now. There's too much data and well, we do have the tools, but what is overwhelming us right now is that there is too much data. So the techniques that we use now are essentially, you know, we use associations, we look for patterns, uh, we start uh, machine learning initiatives, beginning to talk about artificial intelligence. OK, so let's start with the examples. And as you can see from the slide, the initial ones are going to be about where it's just deductive inference, where essentially all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle are with us. And our job really is to just put together that picture. All right, so I presume that some of you, I wish all of you have read novels of Sherlock Holmes. I'm surely the elderly among you must have read it. I'm sure Gore Sahib has definitely read Silver Blaze. That was one of the stories of Sherlock Holmes. And in that, you know, I just reproduce a conversation from that, which is essentially the crux of the matter. Uh, so the local police inspector asks Sherlock Holmes, who has sort of overnight has taken a train, you know, away from London to reach some small town or city somewhere in England. So the inspector asks Sherlock Holmes, is there any point to which you wish to draw my attention? And Holmes's reply is to the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The inspector is surprised. He says, but the dog did nothing. And Holmes says that that was the curious incident. So really there, there's a story there. The story is that sometimes the clues are visible and sometimes the clues are not quite visible, but they're still clues. So those of you who've read that book will, of course, recall that what happened was that there was a prize horse whose name was Silver Blaze who had been stolen, obviously on the eve of a very big race where there was a lot of betting involved and so on. And someone had stolen it uh, from its stables. Uh, and the dog did not bark. We would expect that, you know, there's a dog around the stables and the dog would surely bark if the prize horse were to be stolen. The dog did not bark. And that was the clue that Holmes was giving. And the reason as well, Holmes guessed immediately and as we would guess almost immediately is that an insider was actually letting it out. The owner of the stable, the, actually the person who looked after the horses was the person who was responsible. So when he went out to release the horse, the dog didn't bark because it was not unusual. OK, here's another example. And you probably heard, I mean, if you've done statistics, you've heard of Wald. Now, this is a second World War problem. Some of you may have read it, but look at that picture. Uh, there's a picture of aircraft and those many of those dots that you see are where uh, this is Second World War and basically it's just British planes that are going across to Germany and you know trying to bomb German targets. And all those little white dots that you see look like little bubbles. Uh, those are where the German artillery, the German guns managed to hit the planes. OK, so well, the British assemble together and they say, oh, you know, we have a problem. We are we're losing planes. So how do we solve the problem? So they say, OK, let's look at the planes that have come back. And let's see where they were hit. And then they were sort of inferring that the points where the planes, you know, part of the aircraft structure where it got the most hits was in some sense the most vulnerable. So they're about to decide that, you know, we have to strengthen that part of the aircraft frame so that, you know, vulnerability is reduced. Until Abraham Wald, you know, you must have heard of Wald's. You know, I, I, I do know that there's some big algorithm that Wald has done. So he was called in and then he came up with, he, he just said something like, do you realize that the aircraft that we are looking at are the ones that successfully returned to the base? The aircraft that we lost never came back. So if you're looking at these points and saying that is these points that are responsible for losing aircraft, that's not quite correct because the planes came back. We should really be looking at the structures of aircraft that never came back. And those, of course, have crashed in German territory somewhere. So 
but basically it says that the parts that you think you want to strengthen are not the parts you need to strengthen. The parts where you see are not hit are really the parts that where when they do get hit, the planes crash. So we should be really strengthening not those dotted parts, but we should be strengthening the parts that are not dotted. OK, here's a, another example, and you've all read Shakespeare, you've read Merchant of Venice, and there's a story about Antonio, you know, who ships have shield, sailed somewhere, probably to India or somewhere, uh, to buy spices, which is the usual stuff that they used to buy. And then he needs a lot of money, like even today, you know, we need investors, and they give you money, and they give you money at an interest. And of course, there has to be some mortgage, there has to be some security. So Antonio says that, uh, yeah, if, so Shylock, who's, and just see the typecast in Shylock is a Jew. So he says that if I don't get back my money, then I need a pound of flesh from you. And uh, Antonio says yes, because he has no choice. He needs the money to send off his ships. The ships don't come back, the ships crash. And, and Shylock says, yes, give me your pound of flesh now. Now we all know that a pound of flesh means that essentially Antonio dies. Uh, so that's when his friend Bassanio's uh, wife, Portia, she comes up dressed as a young lawyer and she says, yeah, sure, you'll get your pound of flesh, but the deal only includes a pound of flesh. It does not include even a drop of blood. So as soon as a single drop of blood is shed, the deal is null and void. And obviously you can't get your pound of flesh without the drop of blood. So that is how she manages to save Antonio. But again, the story, uh, interesting part is how Shakespeare or, you know, they try to cast uh, the Jewish faith as, you know, in not such a favorable light. OK, here are more examples and I have to go quickly because I realize that I have been given 10 minutes more, but yeah, let's go faster. Look at the periodic table. You've all studied that in high school. Now, the fun part of the periodic table is that, uh, well, actually, Alexander Mendeleev, the, the Russian chemistry expert, he discovered soon enough that there's a certain pattern and we've all learned that, right? We know the halogens and, you know, helium, helium, the sort of the, what are they called? The, they don't react at all. So we have guys who react a lot. We have guys who don't react, but what's really important is that they all seem to fall into a nice structure. And one of the beauties, and now this is, this would be a story that is what, 75, 80 years old is that looking at the periodic table and looking at the structure that we had discovered, people realize that there are elements that are waiting to be discovered. Now, isn't it amazing that you can say with a lot of confidence that, you know, okay, uh, you know, I don't know which one, but let's say there is one element that should be here. We don't find it yet, but we got to search hard enough. Once we search hard enough, we are going to find it. Okay, here's another example where we try and connect the dots. And this is again, this story I first read in uh, a book that C.R. Rao wrote, C.R. Rao, still alive, India's greatest statistician without a doubt. 101 years old, now on 28th September, he turned 101. So this is something I picked up from his book. And this is about India immediately after independence. There is violence and, you know, certain refugees are holed up in the Red Fort. And uh, yeah, the government in power has to make sure that they get some food. So how do we do that? Essentially, what you want to know, the government will give you food. But what the government wants to know is how many people are stuck up inside there. And the contractor then as now obviously would like to inflate the number so that he can get more money from the government. So he presumably must have quoted a much larger number, uh, which some people in the government may not have been so sure about it. So they got pretty smart about it. They said, OK, don't tell me how many people there are. Uh, just tell me how much rice you consumed. Just tell me how many pulses or dal that you consumed and how much salt that you consumed. Uh, well, obviously he was he had to make up those figures, so he made up some figures. He said, capital R of rice, capital P of pulses, and capital S of salt. But now, and this is where the statistician comes in, he already knows what are the per capita estimates. That is, on the average, how much salt or how much rice or how much pulses does one individual sort of consume? So now look at the ratios, R by R, P by P, or S by S. R is the amount of uh, rice that he claims he used, whereas small R is the amount of rice that one person normally eats. So that ratio is going to tell you, give you one estimate of how many people there are. Similarly, P by P, capital P by small P will give you a second estimate and capital S by small S will give you a third estimate. Now, mm -hmm. really, if the contractor is telling the truth, the three estimates are the same number, which is the number of refugees inside. And yet, as they found in that example, the numbers are widely different. So again, the government official was very clear. He understood that the contractor had no money to make by fudging the salt figures. So he said, whatever is the ratio of capital S by small S, now that that's the that is our estimate of how many refugees are trapped inside and that's the kind of money that we'll give you an ingenious way and uh, well later it turned out that that estimate was rather good okay 
uh, you already introduced me as someone who worked at the National Aerospace Laboratories for you know over 20 years. So I have to give you a couple of aeronautical examples. Here is one. And this is, uh, I think this happened around early 1990s. And there is a pilot who's flying an A320 aircraft and uh, he's about to take off at Hyderabad airport. And remember Hyderabad those days had the Begumpet airport, not uh, the airport that we now have at Shamshabad. And the pilot was at the ed one, ed one end of his runway and he's waiting to take off. Pilots are impatient. They, they, you know, they want to take off because that's the only hard part in the maneuver. After that, there's pretty much nothing to do till you have to land. Uh, but the control tower is saying, no, 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 don't take off right now because at the end of the runway, there are gulls. So now you might wonder why the pilot is not able to see the end of the runway. There's a good reason for that. The Hyderabad runway at Begum Pet Airport had a little bit of a hump in the middle. And because of that, when you're at one edge of the runway, you don't get to see the other edge. So the pilot should have trusted the control tower and waited. But he decided, and you know, that's the arrogance of the pilot. So he said, uh, no, I'm taking off to hell with you. I'm going to take off. And he started sort of taxi. Imagining that there are no there are no birds or there are no girls at the other end. He just thinks that that's some some nonsense he's being told. OK, now now comes the interesting part. You know, an A320 when you take off and incidentally speeds with aircraft are measured in terms of knots. So generally it is the pilot is told that you are safe to take off at about 135 knots when you hit a speed of 135 knots. A uh, speed of let's say below 100 knots is not safe at all. So this pilot starts, he accelerates, he gains speed and crosses the midway and then he really sees the edge of the runway. And what does he find? There are indeed gulls. And the worst thing that can happen for a plane is that you fly into a flock of birds because those birds will get ingested into the engine and the engine is what gives the plane the real thrust and the power to take off. So you can't take off. And at the takeoff point, the engines need to be performing at their best ability. And if there are some dead birds, big dead birds inside, the engine won't take off. So the pilot suddenly saw and he realized that, you know, he can't he can't sort of taxi into the birds, although he will gain more speed that way. He can't taxi in because he's gaining distance, but uh, he's increasing the risk. So at a point which was like 105, 100 knots, 110 knots, he decides to take off. And these are great planes, so he could take off. But as he took off, a little bit of that vertical tail sort of rubbed against the ground. Uh, but he took off and it was a safe flight and uh, of course, very soon the pilot realized that, you know, he's going to be caught because the damage is going to be seen by the maintenance people. Yeah, so the pilot did something clever. You know, he sort of flew the plane for 30 minutes more because the cockpit voice recorder records only the last 30 minutes of conversation. So he said he just makes sure that, you know, he's when he lands, he's finished more than those 30 minutes. So that conversation with the control tower would get erased. And then he landed. And then when someone said what happened, he said, oh, I don't know. But what he didn't know was that there is another thing called the digital flight data recorder that you, you can see this red, often called the black box, although it is like red or orange. And there, if you look at the, a lot of variables are there. And this is the early days of digitization of aircraft. And now look at the value of zero. Zero is, and on the x-axis, you've got the speeds. And then you can just look at that figure and you'll see that just about at 105, 110, that zero has become one, uh, which means that it took off. He should have taken off at 130. Why did he take off so soon? So that proved that uh, he was lying. And as is often the case, the pilot was kicked upstairs, which means that the pilot was not dismissed from service, but he was told you can't fly planes. Now, if you tell a pilot you can't fly planes, it's almost like telling a doctor, you know, you can't practice. Or you can, it's like telling Virat Kohli, you know, don't, don't go and play cricket. Personally, I don't mind that, you know, he's not batting too well these days, uh, but uh, that's the ultimate punishment for a professional. Okay, let's go on to the next. And now we are looking at the we are looking at the second set of examples. Uh, what what is the time? Yeah, I just need to see the time. Yeah, okay, I've got about 12, 20 minutes more. Yeah, okay. So here we are now looking at situations where uh, we don't have enough data. The data is not perfect. You know, in in all the earlier examples I took, you know, there was a way of using smart deduction or using smart instrumentation or using smart analysis or smart discussions. You could eventually arrive at the truth, and the whole idea of uh, so you could arrive at the inference. You know, the game today is about how we infer. So the inference was complete in the earlier examples. Now we are going to have a situation where the data is not enough for us to make a complete or a compelling inference. Then what do we do? But this is what we've learned in statistics right all along, all these years. Gather data and try to fit a probability distribution. Uh, is it fitting normal? Is it fitting log normal? Is it fitting binomial? Is it fit fitting exponential? You know, you know all these distributions and you try and fit these statistical distributions. But why do we do that? 
why are we fitting distributions? Why do we have this chi-square test for goodness of fit that everyone loves? You know, because, you know, the real reason is that uh, distributions are very well characterized. There is a fund of knowledge, there's a wealth of knowledge, there's a century long fund of knowledge about how distributions behave. So if I tell you that a certain data follows a normal distribution, you know, you can make a lot of very smart and very strong and very rich inferences because you know how the data behaves. Uh, so knowing the distribution of a data is really, it's, it's a bit like a doctor, you know, a doctor has to, a doctor's job is to diagnose the illness and then treat, but he can't start his treatment till he knows what the ailment is. And well, the, what the doctor does, well, he expects that there'll be 30, 40 ailments and he knows how to solve, how to cure those 30, 40 ailments. So very much of statistics was like that, you know, there were 30, 40 distributions and, you know, you, these distributions are well characterized, you know, someone had taken the pains, even though there are continuous distributions to make sure that all those values are probably tab properly tabulated in tables. So you can do your testing of hypothesis, p-values, no p-values those days. Yeah, you, you can do all that kind of stuff. And of course, there was a central limit theorem, the wonderful theorem that says that, you know, when n is large enough, you can approximate anything by the cent uh, standard normal distribution. So really what we tried to do, in fact, if we had control over the experiment, we would make sure that n was more than 30 so that uh, you can now use the central limit theorem. I'm not going to quote the theorem, obviously, at this talk today, but it just said if n is greater than or equal to 30, use a Z statistic. Yeah, we did that and we got results and we passed exams. I don't know how many problems we really solved. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. OK, here's another one. Uh, this is about cricket and tomorrow I think I have a bigger talk on cricket. So if you're interested, you should join that. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, what used to happen in cricket matches is that uh, it's a limited over match. We insist on a result. So what happens is that uh, suppose it rains, so there's some interruption, the lights go off, then uh, we don't get a result and people want a result. So really it boils down to now if there's a rain curtailed or some other reason if a match is interrupted and we still want a result. So we have a situation where you know one team has batted so much and then it rains and there's a disturbance and now the other team has to come out to bat or even one team is batting and there's a disturbance and it comes out to bat again. You know, there can be different kinds of interruptions. And for each of these interruptions, what you want finally is you want a winning target. You want to say, yes, the match was interrupted like this, like this, like this. But at the end of it, we want to decide who's going to win. That means you have to set a target. You know, this is the kind of runs that you have to score to win the match. Now, in the past, what you used to do was you just used to look at the strike rate, I mean, the run rate, as they call it. So the first team scored at a run rate of, let's say, four. That means in 50 hours managed to score 200 runs. So you, even if you got 25 hours, as soon as you cross 100 runs, you win. Now, the difficulty with that, and now you realize, you know, especially as we watch T20 matches, you realize that, you know, when you have more wickets in hand, you can bat more adventurously. If you bat more adventurously, then you can score more runs. Of course, there's a little chance that you get out. But, you know, instead of 50 overs, if you've got only 25 overs, or these days it's of 20 overs, you've got only 10 overs or 12 overs. Who cares for the wicket? You want, you know, you want what? You want a Jadeja or you want to Rishabh Pant to come in and, you know, in 10 balls, you want him to hit 25 runs. And then he can get out because he's done his job. Basically, the target is based on runs. And so really what they discovered was that there's, a, there's an intricate interplay between the overs remaining and the wickets that you have. So those together constitute a resource and not just one. The number of balls that you have is not just a sufficient resource. How many balls do you have and how many wickets do you have together that forms a resource? OK, so that was how the duckworth lewis method was done. Incidentally, I'm one of the people who doesn't think so highly of that method now and certainly doesn't think highly of it when we use it for T20, but maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow. OK, let's go on to the next example. And if you look at this, you've seen some of you may have seen the pyramids. Look around the pyramids. I had the good fortune to visit, uh, you know, it's just outside Cairo. I had the good fortune to visit that some years ago. The pyramids are intact, but everything around it is a desert. And then you can well imagine that, you know, such massive, such beautiful constructions. There must have been tens and thousands of people who must have lived for hundreds of years to build that. Where have they gone? Where has that civilization gone? Uh, well, obviously, I, the conditions must have turned so adverse that uh, people couldn't stay there. The pyramids have survived. They have survived, you know, the most, you know, for thousands of years. Why have they not collapsed? You know, it's a very intriguing question. Nobody has an answer. But one of the answers that people recommend is, if you look at that ratio, and you know, I, I don't have a chalk piece here. I, you can't see me properly. Uh, but they say that probably the architects of that time knew what is called the golden ratio. And they designed it using the golden ratio. 
And the golden ratio, if some of you know what is a Fibonacci series, you will know that it's a, a derivative. It's essentially the ratio of consecutive numbers converging in a Fibonacci series. OK, so what's interesting is that we hypothesize that probably the pyramid survived because the architects of that time used the golden ratio. Incidentally, another question as we pass by, you know, you see rabbits. You realize that there are lots of rabbits. Now, if there were too many rabbits, you know, it won't be too good. If there were too little, it won't be so good. So you do wonder, you know, how the number of the rabbit population somehow maintains its equilibrium. What is the rule that they follow? Again, if you were to look inside, and this is a kind of modeling, you look inside and say that essentially the reproduction pattern of rabbits follows the Fibonacci sequence. And you can actually, you can test that out. You know, put two rabbits in an enclosed thing and allow them to mate and then wait for a few months and weeks and see how many new rabbits are being born and what are the numbers of new rabbits that are being born. And you'll see that these numbers are largely Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci numbers are okay. Uh, you, you, I've written that equation there. Okay, how? what's another way of, when I don't have enough data, what do I do? I have to do experimentation. Okay, so here are a couple of examples. And again, you know, you must excuse my bias for aeronautics. Uh, but what you see in the picture on the left is an airframe of the MiG-21 aircraft. Now, this is this is a story that's about 30, 35 years old. Now we are not, no longer flying the MiG aircraft. Indeed, we aren't flying too many of the Russian aircraft. But in the Indian Air Force in the 1970s, early 1980s, the aircraft really was MiG-21. And really what matters is, you know, these are fighter aircraft and uh, they have a service life. And, uh, you know, there is a there is a mechanical engineering concept of metal fatigue that I wish I could describe in front of you. Uh, but OK, let me try it. Let me try it quickly. You know, all of you must have had that gem clip, you know, the one that you have. You have lots of papers and then you want to tag those papers together. So you use a gem clip. Now, suppose I give you one of those gem clips and ask you to open it out. And I say, OK, here, this is a piece of metal. And I say, break it. Do what it takes to break. Now you try to pull hard, you try to tug at that, you're not going to be able to break. Well, it's metal and these are your fingers. You know, how well can you do it? But there's a very easy way to break it because they've already been folded, right? The gem clips have been folded. So, you know, you fold back and forth, back and forth. You know, you do it three or four times, once down, once up, once down, once up. And within three or four of those up and down movements or cyclic motion, you find it snaps. It's a very easy way. Otherwise, it's almost impossible for a human fingers to pull and stretch a piece of wire, but you can do that very easily. Now, that kind of up and down action, up and down action is what happens when an aircraft wing, especially, is flying. You know, you won't see it, obviously. They're not swaying like, you know, big time swaying, but there's a little bit of up and down, up and down happening all the time. And that is causing what you call metal fatigue. And metal fatigue eventually leads to, you know, it leads to cavity. I mean, okay, there are words for that. Eventually, it leads to a structural failure. So what do we do about it? So one way is, you know, so this is what we did at the lab. You know, all those little yellow things, the actuators that you see, they are simulating the actual load that the plane would experience when it was in flight. And then there's a data logging system. Now, all those was, you know, pre big time, big data times. So using that kind of an experiment, we are able to say that, you know, this airframe is going to live for, let's say, 10,000 years. Now, the Soviets will tell you that the life is only 2,500 hours. Not years, hours, of course. Uh, why do they say that? Because they want you to go back to them and pay them more for maintenance or they want you to buy new planes. Uh, so we really want to know. Russians say 2,500 hours is the flying life. How much is it? Is it 5,000? Can I even extend it by 500 hours? Well, these kinds of experiments help you do that. OK, let me give you a, another quick example. And this is very relevant in these uh, still COVID times. And this is what you call the randomized control trials. Now, what is a randomized control trial? You know, you're looking at all these. You're hearing about Pfizer. You're hearing about Moderna. You're hearing about Covishield. You're hearing about Covaxin. You're hearing about all these vaccines. And you're talking of phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials. And what are those phase three trials? What happens there? And why does the WHO insist on phase three trials? The real reason is that, OK, I, I don't have a lot of time, but really what you should do is, you know, I can I can go, you know, I can collect a so-called sample in the classical statistical method, you know, uh, take some three hospitals in Nagpur, four hospitals in Amaravati, five hospitals around Pune, you know, get, gather some data, maybe randomly, uh, and then try to decide how, I, how good is our vaccine or how good is our medication or whatever it is, if you're not talking about COVID. Now, the trouble with that is that you're, you know, OK, you get some number, you say that it is 12%. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not how how sure are you about efficacy? Uh, basically, there can be a confounding is, I mean, did you get cured better because of something within you or 
you know, there are lots of issues there. So what you do in a randomized control trial is that you take a sample and then randomly divide the sample into two groups. One group actually gets the treatment or the medication or whatever it is, and the other group gets the placebo effect. It, you do nothing. So you take a sample and then you give one set of usually an equal group. One guy gets the treatment, the other guy gets nothing. And then you look at how many people uh, survive or how many people get cured in this and that. And effectively, you look at the change in the ratio, the ratio of the recovery pattern. And if that ratio of the recovery pattern is good enough, that means that it is efficacy. And you know, there's a way of computing the efficacy, which is quite easy. So that's what you do in sample three. But the, the beautiful thing there is that randomized control trials basically, you know, they make sure that you eliminate those kinds of biases. Incidentally, the nine, 2019 Nobel Prize in economics went to, of course, uh, the French lady and our own Abhijit Banerjee. And they got it for using randomized control trials, uh, not in a sort of clinical environment, but more in an economic environment. Basically, one of the examples that they looked at was what is the impact of giving midday meals to promote, say, school education? You know, it is true that in India, a large number of kids are actually going to school for the free lunch that they get. But that's good. I mean, what is the price of a free lunch? And you go back and evaluate how good that person is going to be in later life. And you, know, you just give him some dal chawal, you know, and uh, he goes on to become a great Indian. Now, isn't it worth it? So that's the kind of thing the economists worry about. OK, so yeah, Lata Mangeshkar, Suman Kalyanpur. You know, we've all heard their songs. And of course, Lata Mangeshkar is the greatest, but Suman Kalyanpur is very good too. The sad part is that, you know, she lived in an era when Lata Mangeshkar was dominating. And really now, so and even now, some of us, we do have a doubt. We have a doubt. Let's say I listen to a song and you ask me, is it Lata Mangeshkar singing or Suman Kalyanpur singing? Now, I personally do have a doubt. You know, sometimes I do confuse. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's Lata singing or Suman Kalyanpur singing. I have a friend. His name is Rajiv Karandikar. He says he's very sure how to do it. I'm not so sure. OK, so how do I solve this problem? Well, one thing is I can do some kind of, you know, you know I can use some transforms. I can do some filtering. And, you know, I can actually take an analog plot of Lata singing and Suman Kalyanpur singing. And let's say that there is Lata's peak or, you know, the pattern of a plot is one way and Suman Kalyanpur's pattern is the other. And then if I've got testing methodologies that allow me to clearly dis distinguish between those two patterns, then I do that kind of an analysis that some transform, some it, actually it's called a capstral tra transform, which is the inverse of a spectral transform, and that allows you to do it. Now, incidentally, there's another way to do it now today with big data. You know, let's say you give me a 1965-1966 song. Let's say Choti Si Mulakat Pyar Ho Some of you may have heard it. Uh, it is a, from a film called Choti Si Mulakat that Uttam Kumar had produced. Now, is the female voice Lata or Suman Kalyanpur? Well, it's a duet. It is being sung with Mohammad Rafi. And now I know, I have prior information that between 1963 and 1967, Lata did not sing with Rafi. So if it's a female voice in 1965, which sounds like Lata, it still can't be with Lata because Rafi sang it. So look at the, see, in one way I'm using pure science to find out, and in the other example, I'm using all the data around it. I'm using associations. And you know, that is really the story of big data in some sense. I don't need to know how Lata sings. I don't even need to know any song. All I need to know is a, a lot of information around the singers. Like this singer does not sing with that singer during that period for this kind of producer at that point of time. You know, all this surrounding data can allow you to make an inference, uh, which was practically impossible till big data came along because we just didn't have enough data. OK. I just have two more slides and now I'm looking at, uh, as you can see from the top, I'm looking at pictures where there's too much data. Now there's too much, too much data, you know, is it a good thing? Well, it's a good thing, but you know, you, you're getting more resources, uh, but you need more power to sort of exploit those resources. So with the coming of big data, I know here are a couple of examples. Uh, let's look at the first one, you know, this HR process, you know, hiring, recruiting. Now, all of us who are old enough have gone through the process of hiring people. And if you ask yourselves honestly, how many good hires did I make and how many not so good hires did I make? I realized that, you know, I didn't do as good a job as I think I did. And then eventually what I realized much more, and some of you I'm sure have been senior enough to have been sitting on this selection committee and appraisal meetings, you know, they go on for days together. It becomes such a big bore. And you ask the same questions and you expect the same answers. So really, how how discriminating are your, is your interviewing process? So then the Americans decided, you know, why don't we sort of automate it? So why don't we do some kind of machine learning? So why don't we feed in all the data of, you know, hundreds and thousands of interviews that happened over the last so many years? 
kinds of questions they asked, kinds of answers, what answers were rated highly, what answers were not, and all the base of all that stuff. Can't we get a computer to do the evaluation? Or at least can't we get a computer to produce a shortlist for us? Out of the 10,000 employees, the computer can present us 100 and then we can choose 10 out of those. They try to do that. In fact, Amazon, you know, a lot of companies about five, 10 years ago tried to do that. So, you know, OK, when you train a learning algorithm, there's something called the training data. Because how does it learn? You've got it has to look at the data and it has to learn from that data. The algorithms, typically the neural algorithm inside, they allow you to train you how to do it. But remember that all this training is biased because if. If the training data is sort of uh, data generated by a certain number of a group of people who have a certain known bias, then that bias is going to get integrated into the training process. And therefore you think that, oh, you know, you're doing a great job, but no, no, you're actually carrying forward the biases. And that's a terrible thing. And actually what you find is that at least in the US scenario, white males are preferred. If you're colored, you don't have a chance. If you're a woman, you have much less chance. And if you're a black woman, you practically have no chance. Not because they are bad, but because algorithms are determining that they are bad. The algorithms are determining that because they are being ruled or driven by the biases of the learning system. OK, OK, well, here's a more positive example. You know, one of the good things that machine learning does today, machine learning, we are at a stage where it can do some things very well and it still can't do some things very well. And all the claims that people make about everything working well and, you know, fear about AI and, you know, when Frankenstein tomorrow is going to capture your life, that's not going to happen in our lifetimes. Even some of you are young, it's not going to happen in your lifetimes. But what machine learning can do very well is especially with patterns and pictures. When I look at patterns and pictures, uh, let's let's take an example. Let's let's take a lung, let's, let's take a patch on a lung and you want to know whether it's a malignant patch or not. Now, let's say I asked 10 doctors, you know, and 10 doctors said, oh no, they were very sure. So this is what you call the labeling, the pictures, if you like. So the experts, you ask a certain number of experts and they classify. They say, yeah, this is malignant, this is benign. This is malignant, this is benign. And then that information is used. And then what these learning algorithms do is, okay, so now they look at the other features which you and I may not be able to see or may not be able to quantify. Uh, the, and basically they learn, they learn something. So you, if you ask yourself, how did that doctor know that this is malignant? Okay, you ask him, he'll tell you, you know, something round, or you know, that color is deep, or you know, some shape is like that. He'll tell you, he'll tell you something, but it's basically his knowledge. He can tell you a few things, so he can be a little bit tacit, but not completely. So really, if there is a, if there is a learning system that can model all his thought processes better than the doctor wants to, or is able to, then we are doing somewhere. So today's machine learning and AI, the best things that are happening are that when you're looking at pictures, it's going to get very good. OK, here's another example, and it's a quick one because I don't have time. You know, essentially, we all know cricket. We know batsmen, bowlers, all-rounders, and all that. Uh, but you know what happens is a batsman, bowler, there's lots of cricketing data. There are lots of columns. And now someone says, you know, what kind of a batsman is Matthew Hayden? OK, I know he's a he's an aggressive opening batsman, uh, but uh, someone else doesn't know. So then what I try to do is, you know, if you see the smile on the face, if you see the triangle of the nose, if you see the, you know, diameter of the ears, you know, so I model all these human characteristics onto one variable. This is called Chernoff faces. I model that and then I reproduce the picture. And looking at the picture without even knowing cricket, uh, because you know what are the modeling rules, you can say, ah, that looks like an aggressive batsman. So you can see Matthew Hayden, well, Ricky Ponting looks quite a lot like him. If you look at Glenn McGrath and Mutya Murlitharan, they look quite similar, which is not a surprise because both are aggressive bowlers who take a lot of wickets. OK, don't worry, this is the last slide. So we're almost there. OK, how did Google learn to translate? Now, we, you know, in the 70s, uh, incidentally, this expert systems, artificial intelligence, machine learning, this talk has started from the 60s and 70s. Sometimes there is hope. You know, there was something called expert systems that people thought they'd do a lot about. But what happens is that it eventually fizzles out. And the reason for that was they were trying to apply the old rules to gain new victories. And that doesn't happen. I mean, if you want to learn how to translate 50 years ago, what would you do? If I want to translate something from English to Hindi, OK, this English word has this Hindi word. The equivalent of that English word is this Hindi word. The equivalent of that English word is this Hindi word. So I map all the English words to the Hindi words. OK, that's the easier part. The harder part is that the syntax. In Hindi, you know, we know that the verbs in most Indian languages, the verbs come at the end of the sentence, whereas in English letters, they come in the middle. But that's a syntax issue. And that also can be based on rules that can be modeled. So that is how people are trying to do translation. Uh, 
it didn't work beyond a point. Of course, the idiom was horrible. I mean, you know, if you if you want if you looked at a translation of say Mirza Ghalib into English, it was painful even if it was correct or not correct. And that is because you know just rules and dictionaries are not enough. There is an idiom inside a language, and how do you capture that idiom? And again, you know, so many languages, so many you know, so many pairs of languages you have to make dictionaries for. Uh, it was too difficult. It was not possible. Now, what Google does is it's completely different. It it is based on associations. All it knows is that this pattern, which is probably in Mandarin Chinese, is occurring far more frequently with this English word, which means dumbbell. Let's say, I know that English word means dumbbell, which itself has its own pattern, and corresponding to that, in uh, I looked at millions and millions of words, and I see oh, that is associated with this pattern in Mandarin language. So I sort of, the more I see the association, the higher is my probability that those two words probably mean the same, and that that is how. You know, Google's dictionaries today, they don't need to know any language. OK, here is another funny example, but uh, uh, this could be an example of what you call spurious associations. You know, people find that those who buy a lot of beer seem to buy a lot of nappies. Now, is there any good reason for that? We don't know. But supermarkets don't care beyond a point. They say people who buy beer buy nappies. OK, make, uh, let me make sure that where I'm uh, putting the beer in the market, I'll put the nappies as well so that, you know, he can quickly make his buy. And he'll say, oh, in that supermarket, the beer and nappies come very close to each other. In this, they don't, so I'll go to that supermarket. So, you know, it's these small advantages. But that leads us to the problem, and indeed, that's the last problem I'm going to talk about, uh, correlation. And in today's world, you know, the, the, the big debate now, let's say some of you go for interviews tomorrow. It's There's a very high probability that someone in the interview will ask, can you distinguish between what is correlation and what is causation? What is correlation? I know what is correlation. Uh, I, Correlation coefficient, if it's a linear relationship, it's a number lies between minus one and plus one. If it's plus one, there's a perfect linear relationship, positive, and so on, so on. We've learned correlation, or we will be learning that in our statistics classes. The point is that, like, if beer and nappies come together, does it really mean that there is there is some cause? Uh, is nappies, mind you, is, is there a cause that, you know, if you drink more beer, you're likely to need more nappies? I can't find any cause. And it's... Supermarket will say, I don't care if there's a cause or not. As long as it makes me more profitable, I do it. So the, the key question there is, you see correlations. Is there a cause? Now, historically, what used to happen is, it's very different. You know, we had experience and we would, we would suspect a cause. We would suspect a causation. And then we would gather data and see whether there is correlation. So, you know, this wasn't a big debate. But what's happening now with big data is there's so much data and so many correlations coming together and so many unknown vague variables coming together. You don't realize whether they are coming together just by a statistical quirk or they are coming together because there's a hidden underlying reason that we still don't know. That is causation. So, yeah, the last last point I make is the 2021 Nobel Prize in economics. It's interesting that economics, well, it's actually not a real Nobel Prize, but the economic prizes are so data intensive in the last two years. So they found that in the US state of New Jersey, when they increased the minimum wages, they increased the minimum wages for some reason, and they suspected that because the minimum wages have been raised, employment will go down. The simple argument being, you know, the same part of money, I'm actually paying it to fewer people, so there'll be fewer employed guys. And then they found that, you know, even though you raised, you in, increase the minimum age, the employability did not actually go down. So as you know, classical economic theory, they started getting worried. Uh, and then they say, is it not true? Is it true? Is there a correlation? Is there a causation? What is it? And then, you know, what you can't do is, you can't look at the before and after data for the same state because there could be other reasons. Maybe there was an earthquake there, or maybe, you know, some big uh, Microsoft set up a big office there and that increased employment, you know, various reasons. So you can never be sure that the before after is because of this. I mean, you, so what did they do? They looked at neighboring state of Pennsylvania, neighboring, so it's nice, you feel. In Pennsylvania, they did not increase, they did not increase the minimum wage. And yet they found that when employability was growing in New Jersey, it was also growing in Pennsylvania. So it was a deeper, wider economic phenomenon. And this, this is what the this study that the Nobel laureate said in 1992, and now that's come to what they're beginning to call natural experiments. So Nobel Prize for randomized control testing, Nobel Prize for natural experiments in economics. OK, so as you can see, that ends my slide and thank you. I actually, yeah, I'm glad I got 13 minutes more. Thank you very much.
of Statistica 2021 and I hope you will keep your cooperation with us. Also, we will be glad if you participate in upcoming activities and competition. Our Adharva Khoth on behalf of our statistic department have got an opportunity to offer a vote of thanks uh, on this national workshop to end this inauguration session. I would like to thank Dr. Srinivas Bhuglesar for accepting our invitations and delivering keynote address as well as one invited talk on this national workshop. You made us you made us are about the data data in much more wider sense and the way you have convey it in stories, mysteries, give student to know the data in an entertaining way. Then you gave us ideas about fitting of idea using distributions through your dry modeling presentation made us realizing that how important are the distributions. Then you talk about the randomized control trial which help to eliminate the biasness of data gave us an idea of importance of it in clinical trial and one can study the safety and efficiency of new treatment with the help of it. I'm grateful to all eminent resource person, Dr. Anil Gore sir, Dr. S.B. Mahadik sir, Mr. Samadhan Bhuvadi sir for accepting our invitation to deliver their valuable talks on this day. Without your invited talk, the program would not have been so popular. I am obliged to our honorable principal, Dr. Prashant Silke sir for his constant, uh, constant support, motivation and cooperation. I am helpful to and thankful to you sir for principal address. I hereby thanks to our vice principal, Dr. Yoel sir for offering prayer in the inaugural, inaugural session of workshop and for your courtesy and support. I will to thanks. I wish to thanks all the 30 teachers and the students who have registered themselves to their two day national level workshop. We, we are glad to see 380 members have seen registered has been registered to attend this day. And 340 members have joined the telegram group. Also, I thanks to all the 137 students who have participated at Statstar competition. I'm equally thankful to all the Department of Statistics of many colleges in India for sending their students to participate in the workshop. I hope that they have enjoyed taking part in various competitions. I, on behalf of our Department of Statistics and entire organization team, crew, our special guests and our valuable audience, let me call it Fraternity of Statistics here together. And on my behalf, I would like to extend a very hereby thanks to all of you for gracing us with your distinguished staff talk and sharing your findings and opinions today. I hope we have been introduced more to such renowned identities from academics and institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such an amazing session, for your vital appearance and for giving us your precious time. It really means a lot to us. You have surely added to the charm of this event. Competition teaches us big lessons. It drives us to be the best we can be for our better future and shapes us the best. Let's begin our session two with the first competition of the workshop, Stat Maze, and let the game for winning begin. Here I call upon Master Ronak Pahuja and Master Akshar Panchakshari for beginning the one. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Then let's confirm it. Hello everyone, myself Ronak Pahuja presenting before you start maze. Q2 e start maze. The rules for Q2 e start maze are as follows. Participant will be given only one minute to answer the answer once the clue is displayed participants are to answer in the chat box of the meeting chat box has been enabled for you all points will be given to the participant who answers correctly first the names of the participant who answers correctly first will be noted down by the our scorers miss ishita and miss bhumika gajbi scorers ready our first Clue a tool for data collection. 
let me do know if the answer has been there in the chat box question error has been answered by harshini it's correct scorers please write the name our next clue if a union b equal to s then events a and b are called timer has been started the first one was by the first one was by who is that exhaustive tanmay tanmay said the answer it's correct scholars please write it third clue subset of sample space timer is already started it's 10 seconds event answered by anushri Anushree. yeah fourth clue arrangement of data in accordance with time anushri gave the answer again time series the words are means you can see t i m e s e r i e s anushri again scholars please mark it anushri has been second time oh, so sorry most used measure of dispersion standard deviation mm, correct answer was yes HS. standard deviation hs guest who is let anup disable the mic for them sorry enable mic for him hs please uh, write your name in the chat box that will be yeah. more feasible you have to note down the names hs who is that hs please write your name in the chat box else will give the marks to the points will be given to the other one whose name is mentioned here what is to be done akshar yeah uh, the answer is correct standard deviation uh, the next clue hypothesis which is tested for possible rejection anushree again null hypothesis it's a correct answer pearson's correlation coefficient measures this relationship anushree again fourth time <laughs> it's a linear relationship great to know she is really enthusiastic a crude measure of dispersion aditi d was the first to answer range anushri just missed by a second anushri ji can you write your full name sorry aditi d will the scorers will mention it in the sheet next clue one technique of statistical inference 
एस्टिमेशन सौरभ ए यस इट्स करेक्ट स्कोरर्स प्लीज मेंशन राइट द नेम सौरभ सौरभ कैन यू राइट अ फुल नेम सौरभ जायसवाल स्कोरर्स प्लीज नोटेड a lower order scale of measurement nominal aditi or meenal which is which one is to be selected as aditi wrote nomina she she didn't means wo oh, typing error hai i should i guess aditi should be selected ha wo type mein fast theek hai yes. it can be accepted Again, Aditi, scorers, please note down. She is second or third time. I feel which dash method is used in time series for forecasting? Yeah, least cost. Mm, I feel so not. Not the correct one. Least square is the correct answer. Ishika P. Ishika, please. Uh, Anup, uh, list me the name. Dekh ke ek baar bata dijiye. Scorers ko kya naam hai pura? Pura attendees ke list me naam hoga. Anup. Yeah. Ishika, uh, first name is Ishika. Ishika, uh, Ishika. Pawar. Ishika Pawar. Scorers, please note it down. The next clue: mistake in calculation. Who was the first one to answer? थर्टींथ क्लू अ टाइप ऑफ डेविएशन विच इज स्क्वेर रूट ऑफ द एवरेज ऑफ स्क्वेर एरर्स अ टाइप ऑफ डेविएशन विच इज स्क्वेर रूट ऑफ द एवरेज ऑफ स्क्वेर एरर्स द आंसर इज द आंसर स्टार्ट विथ आर नॉट एस It's a long word. One, two, three, four. Twenty-three letter word. This seems to be tough, uh, Ronak. <laughs> no one is answering. There in the group, the answer is there. Great, great. Who is that? Ma'am, uh, Saurab wrote it uh, short form. R uh, root M S E. Can it be considered? No, ask him the full form. Ma'am, full form was answered later on. No, don't then give the uh, full form correct answer. If the one who has written the full form correctly is the correct one. My um, answer is root mean square deviation. Arun S wrote that answer correctly. Other other wrote root mean square root mean square error and deviation. Let me show the answer. Yeah, it's root mean square deviation. Correct answer. Arun S will be given the points. Because he wrote the answer correctly. 
others wrote the short form normal harshini n harshini n an important continuous symmetric probability distribution scholars please note it the 15th clue now central limit theorem is the basis of these tests na it starts with l not m sorry not n anushri g again she is i feel fifth time or fourth time large sample the correct answer means the complete one should be large sample test Now it should be considered or not? It she later wrote that. Sample. She later wrote that large sample. Then uh, in the coming messages, a test she written. Is she the first one to write a large sample test? Ma'am, she wrote yes, large she... sample first, and after that she wrote. I mean, just a second. In the next line, he she read wrote text test also. Acha. Before that, nobody identified it correctly. No, ma'am. Okay, then give her. Okay, ma'am. the 16th clue on your screen now a compete a component of time series a component of time series what starts with t it is a it's a five letter word arvind m was the first one to answer trend is the correct answer 17th clue on the screen now statistical dash highlights important facts and figures the word is around seven letter i feel yeah bhageshri m is the right bhageshri m uh, mentioned the correct answer diagram yes scores please note it bhumika and ishita bhagyashri m i'll i'll send you the final uh, full name also bhagyashri can you please mention your full name in the chat box so that so that scores can note it bhagyashri mahajan bhagyashri mahajan scores please note it 18th widely used measure of central tendency this is the Yeah, Tanmay T. Uh, Tanmay T. Answer the first. Oh, so sorry. R. T. V. Answer the first. I feel R. T. V. and Tanmay T. Both should be given the point just because they answered exactly the at the same moment. Yes, yes. R. T. V. and Tanmay T. Anup, please confirm the full name. Uh, Tanmay, it's Tanmay Telkar, but Arti V. I don't know what V stands for. Arti, can you please write the full name in the chat box? Arti Valwani, scores please noted. Nineteenth clue, an allocation in stratified sampling. proportional name and allocation rtv again scores please note it the last and the final clue of the start q2 uh, is start mains full form of nrr net net rate nominal rate of interest 
net run rate no no it's not of it's not related to cricket do not give any clue let them think yes ma'am yes it's the correct answer arvin m net reproduction rate congratulate him yeah and i feel the most enthusiastic person to answer in this and q2 is stat maze what was anushree her full name i don't remember anushree was the most enthusiastic she answered around 5 to 6 questions means she answered every question but first anushree. answer was 5 to 6 questions complete the maze Congratulations, Ravanak, for completing the maze in just 30 or 35 minutes, and we are not lagging behind. I mean, then took 30 minutes to. Yes. Okay. Okay. Priya. You are not audible. Unmute, Ria. Priya, you are not audible. Srishti, start. Yes, ma'am. We have been blessed to introduce to all the renowned resource person from academics here. I, Srishti Mishra, have got an opportunity to introduce Dr. Anil Gore sir. Dr. Anil Gore sir is a charismatic personality who has great interest and has an immense knowledge of the subject. He is an eminent statistician in the field of applied statistics. Sir is an expert statistical consultant with a demonstrated history of working in industry. He is skilled in analytics, statistical modeling, as well as leadership in setting up teams and mentoring them, data analysis, clinical trials, FMCG manufacturing. Sir is a strong business development professional with a PhD in statistics from University of Kentucky. Sir was a former professor and head of department of statistics in Pune University for almost 28 uh, years from April 79 to July 2007. He joined the University of Michigan as a visiting professor where he did teaching, researching and consulting for a year from August 2007 to July 2008. Gore sir was the vice president statistical service at CITL for 10 years during 2008 to 2017. At CITL, Sir did analysis of clinical trials, led a team of young statisticians, trained them, mentored them, oversaw ongoing assignment, and ensured timely and quality delivery. 
He also interacted with client POC and planned and analyzed FMCG trials. Currently, Sir is working as a statistical consultant. Gauri Sir always identifies talent, innovation, and enthusiasm among the statistics students, researchers, and teachers. He keeps motivating them for doing a fruitful work. He tries to motivate researchers in statistics towards working in the field of st applied statistics. So he has been a mentor for many persons in the field of statistics and he will deliver his invited talk on statistics and dictionary diet for diabetes. Looking at the topic, one can infer that how statistics can be used as medicine in various fields. I wish to thank him for his guidance in the conduction of this workshop. So even your presence brings a lot of enthusiasm and encouragement for all the students as well as the teacher of statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Shristi. I hereby request Sir to please take up the platform and deliver his talk on statistics and dictionary diet for diabetes and acknowledge us. Please, Sir. Hello, sir. Are you there? Hello, Gore, sir. I just saw the attendee list. I feel so is not here. Achha. Okay, okay. Just a minute. Yes, I'm easier. Okay. Surya, so, you just call him again. Call upon him again. Really sorry, sir. I didn't knew you. You are in the attendees list, and the mic were disabled for attendees. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, I think, uh, Srishti, uh, sir, uh, you again read biodata. Can you read? Sir, you were not there, I think, when she read the bio data. Okay, that is the the bio data. Srishti, can you again read the bio data? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Welcome, sir. Thank you. We have been blessed to introduce to all the renowned resource person from academics here. I, Srishti Mishra, have got an opportunity to introduce Dr. Anil Gore, sir. Dr. Anil Gori sir is a charismatic personality who has great interest and has an immense knowledge of the subject. He is an eminent statistician in the field of applied statistics. Sir is an expert statistical consultant with a demonstrated history of working in industry. He is skilled in analytics, statistical modeling, as well as leadership in setting up teams and mentoring them, data analysis, clinical trials, FMCG manufacturing. Sir is a strong business development professional with a PhD in statistics from University of Kentucky. Sir was a former professor and head of Department of Statistics in Pune University for almost 28 years from April 1979 to July 2007. He joined the University of Michigan as a visiting professor where he did teaching, researching and consulting for a year from August 2007 to July 2008. Gori Sir was the Vice President in Statistical Service at CITL for 10 years during 2008 to 2017. At CITL, Sir did analysis of clinical trials, led a team of young statisticians, trained them, mentored them, oversaw ongoing assignment, and ensured timely and quality delivery. He also interacted with client POC and planned and analyzed FMCG trials. Currently, Sir is working as a statistical consultant. Gori Sir always identifies talent, innovation, and enthusiasm among the statistics students, researchers, and teachers. He keeps motivating them for doing a fruitful work. 
He tries to motivate researchers in statistics towards working in the field of applied statistics. So he has been a mentor for many persons in the field of statistics, and he will deliver this, uh, his invited talk on statistics and dictionary diet for diabetes. Looking at the topic, one could infer that how statistics can be used uh, as a medicine in various fields. I wish to thank him for his guidance in the conduction of this workshop. Sir, even your presence brings a lot of enthusiasm and encouragement for all the students as well as the teachers of statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Srishti. I hereby request sir to please take up the platform and deliver his talk on statistics and the shit diet for diabetes and acknowledge us. Sir, please. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and share my slides with you. And you have to tell me if you can if you can see my screen. Yes, sir, it's visible. OK, so I begin now. Uh, one more thing. Uh, would you kindly advise me when I, I am within 10 minutes of, of my time? OK, sir. Great, thank you. So let us begin. I'm going to talk about statistics for ODDD and serendipity. And ODDD is obesity, diabetes, and dikshit diet. Uh, <clears throat> I told you the meaning of the title, and I will explain to you what is the word serendipity. Then we'll talk about obesity and dieting and diabetes and Dixit diet and serendipity. And then we'll talk about uh, a trial to test the claim that Dixit diet helps in diabetes and the problems faced while, while planning and designing this trial and then what happened, etc. Okay, so to begin with, let me make my initial comment, which is to say to the students, that you are very lucky uh, to have selected statistics as a subject because right now at this moment of time statistics is a very hot subject and people are in demand not only in our country but all over the world uh, lots of jobs waiting for good statisticians the only thing is that most of these jobs are in application of statistics and this is not a surprise. Think about engineers. Most of the engineers are involved in application of engineering. Very few are involved in research in engineering. Same with medicine. Most of the doctors do practicing. And if you do research, the same will be is true of statistics today, that most of the jobs are in applications or practice of statistics. And a few are uh, available in the field of research in statistics. But there is a difference between statistics and, say, engineering and medicine. In statistics, when you go into application, you have to know something about the field in which to apply. Uh, because, you know, in the last example, the, the lecture that you heard, you know, he began with aeronautics and music and world war and cancer and, and cricket and whatnot. So statistics is employed in every domain. But before you can do it well, you must know a lot about that domain. And statistics education in India has this weakness that students do not learn about any domain of application. Uh, so my recommendation to you is identify a domain that you like and then read about it. Even if there is no exam, even if there is no syllabus, read nice books. Uh, what are the areas potential application of statistics uh, involved in? Well, biology and health, uh, economics and finance, banking, insurance, uh, geology, whatever, a uh, whole range of topics. And you can pick something, agriculture. So the first advice to the students is you have tremendous opportunity. The opportunity can be grabbed if you are good in theory of statistics, but also if you are familiar with the area of application. All right, so let us uh, start. Now, this is an application in the field of health. 
But first about serendipity, and you should look up this word in dictionary, uh, try to find out more about it. It comes from a Sanskrit word, Suvarnadvip. It is the ancient name for Sri Lanka. And there was some story that a prince of Suvarnadvip went out looking for something and accidentally found something much more valuable. That accident, a very pleasant accident, then uh, has come to be known as serendipity. So it's a beneficial chance event. And there are this happens all the time in science. <clears throat> so here are a few examples. Penicillin, insulin to treat diabetes, quinine for malaria, X-ray, Teflon, microwave oven, Velcro. I presume you are familiar with most of these. Uh, Teflon is the coating on, on cooking pots, uh, which make them non-sticks. And Velcro is the surface which uh, which catches with its uh, opposite uh, on, I don't know, in many, many places. So, I don't know if you are familiar with the medicine called quinine for malaria, because it is now kind of outdated and we, we use something different. But there are lots of examples and we'll discuss only one example. But you should read about all these examples and... Almost all the material that I show is available in uh, Wikipedia and general Google search. So let's talk about penicillin. And the, the famous name is Alexander Fleming. So this is his picture surrounded by all kind of uh, what are called petri dishes and, and tubes. Uh, this is about 100 years ago. So we, the discovery of penicillin <clears throat> is a serendipitous event. That means it happened by accident, but it was a wonderful thing to happen. Uh, and we should know a little bit about what happened. <clears throat> so the, there is this bacterium called Staphylococcus. So you see, so you need to know a little bit about microbiology. Uh, and it turned out that a certain blue-green mold or a fungus uh, contaminated a petri dish. See, lots of these uh, terms will come up. Petri dish is simply a, a glass dish in which you grow the bacteria. Okay, And uh, you want pure culture of that bacterium. And sometimes by accident, some contamination occurs there. So this was a contamination by a blue-green fungus. But this fungus killed the sur bacteria surrounding it. Now, this was the accident. So when this happens, of course, uh, most people would throw away that material uh, because it happens all the time. <clears throat> but Fleming did not throw that away and Fleming pursued the study of that particular fungus. Now, why did he do that? All others who had faced similar contamination threw away. He did not because he had an earlier experience. That experience is worth remembering. What had happened was accidentally a teardrop from his ear, from his eye, fell into a bacterial sample. And where it fell, it cleaned up the bacteria. So he decided that tears have some antibacterial property. Now we know that it is tears contain an enzyme called lysozyme uh, that can fight off minor bacterial growth. This he knew. Therefore, when he found another thing which is killing bacteria, he knew that he had found another bacterial killer. So this experience, this hard work, this previous study is what prepares you for that serendipity. If he, if he had not had that experience, he probably would have missed the importance of what he saw because most other bacteriologists had missed the importance. So he found penicillin. But the beauty is <coughs> that not only he was not the first, he was not uh, the latest. The first people we know at least a thousand years ago, people had discovered that this fungus uh, is has antibacterial properties. And all this information is available in the uh, on, on Internet. So, <coughs> excuse me. Egyptians... See, if you have stale bread, then fungus grows on it. We all, I hope you have seen this happen sometime, unless your family is very particular about getting rid of stale bread very quickly. If it stays around, 
if you go out of town and come back after two three days then sometimes you will see this this fungus that grows the egyptian knew that you can put it on the wound and it cleans up the wound it has antibiotic properties they did not use the word antibiotic that's a modern word <clears throat> but what they saw is what we see too so fungus has antibiotic properties is known for a long long time but he took it further and actually extracted medicine out of it so what is the lesson the lesson is that we should take old beliefs seriously it was a long standing belief that moldy bread fungal bread is good for cleaning wounds we should take this belief seriously there may be some serious science underlying it what do you mean take it seriously what should we do do we should we believe what is believed traditionally and the answer is no no you should not believe you should treat those as hypotheses and check them okay so this is what you should do with traditional knowledge if your grandmother tells you something uh, helps you in something else don't dis don't uh, ignore it uh, don't treat it with contempt uh, it could be a potentially very useful drug we'll take just another example velcro so you probably have seen um, something called the a cockle bur you know these are the seeds with kind of uh, pointy uh, extensions and they can they can stick to your your pant if you are a if you are a hiker you would know such things and they stick to your pant they stick to your socks they stick to the dog's hair and so on and somebody decided to work on it so it has hooks and and, and it sticks to anything with a loop structure so this fellow created a a piece surface with hooks and another surface with loops and those two surfaces uh, stick to each other so that is how velcro was discovered anyway <clears throat> oh venin and malaria all right so malaria is very old or in the sense uh, people have recorded malarial symptoms for thousands of years but people did not know any medicine and portuguese people found that so called indians in latin america knew a medicine and what is their story that the local fellow had a fever and he drank water in a pond and that water was very bitter and he thought he had swallowed some poison and will die but in fact he got cured the fever was gone so it, it turned out that it was water coming from the cinchona tree so they decided that cinchona tree has has uh, the property of curing fever and this quinine can be extracted from so it's a juice from cinchona tree it's an extremely uh, bitter bitter medicine but malaria is a very very bad disease and people were happy to receive any kind of medicine for it so this was also accidentally uh, discovered so teflon was discovered because there were gases used in refrigeration and those gases at that time were ammonia and sulfur dioxide and they are both toxic for for people so better uh, gas was needed and a gas was produced and stored and next day there was no gas but the weight was the same that means that gas had become a liquid or solid or something in between <clears throat> and that stuff uh, became known as teflon and it was used for creating non stick surfaces <clears throat> okay i have too many examples maybe i should skip this one <clears throat> so we come to the problem that we want to talk about and obesity everybody knows what is obesity so this guy is obviously obese his paunch is unbelievably big <clears throat> and we all laugh when we see such people and uh, you know caricatures of such people are also very common <clears throat> here is an exceptional person this person weighed i am not sure whether it is 500 pounds or 500 kilos but she was not able to even get up uh, because can you imagine getting up with 500 kilos on your back not possible and she was an egyptian lady and she was flown into india for a surgery i think she went back happily when her weight decreased to about 250 instead of 500 so these are very pathological cases but here is a picture of a boy and he is fat for his age excuse me
so this is obesity. All right. So what are the facts that there are a lot of obese people in the world? <laughs> Why one estimate 65 crore? And US has the worst uh, of these problems. Japan has the, is the best and India is in between. And some people say India is about 13 crore of people who are obese uh, at different levels. And half of them are so obese that they are morbidly obese. That means they are sick uh, with overweight. Not everybody with overweight is sick. But if you have too much overweight, you are sick or morbid. <clears throat> because that causes terrible problems for your body. Your blood pressure goes up, you get diabetes, you get heart attack and so on. It's all very bad for you. <clears throat> Why do people become obese? Maybe they don't eat right. Maybe they don't exercise right. And maybe they have some genes. These are considered three major causes of obesity. <clears throat> if you have genes, you, that cannot be changed. Then you have to... You have to work on the other two, diet and exercise, okay? <clears throat> and that is why gymnasium, gyms and diets is, is big business. <clears throat> so diet business is very big. A lot of people make a lot of money. And hardly anybody becomes thin. <clears throat> <clears throat> so somebody wrote that weight loss is 80% food, 20% exercise, and 0% massages and machines and belts and pills for weight loss. <clears throat> There is a lot of fake advertising. I lost three kilograms in one month with, with green tea, things like that. Why this dishonesty? We are, consumers are responsible for it because people want shortcuts, quick results, and they don't want discipline. <clears throat> what you really need to do is change your lifestyle. Okay, so here's a typical ad. I, I borrowed it from... from newspaper or something. So I was 90 kilograms, now I am 62 kilograms. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm in a meeting. <clears throat> so they say, we know how to reduce weight. Just give us money. <clears throat> and it's very easy. It's very... Check the ads because they always emphasize that it is very easy. Because if it is difficult, then nobody wants to buy your product. And how much is the cost? The cost is substantial. The fellow has to make money. So US FDA approved pills for one year cost about one lakh rupees. This is for the United States. We can't afford that. <clears throat> Indian Ayurvedic pills were slimming two rupees to 60 rupees. And a gym in Pune, 2,000 to 6,000 rupees per month. <clears throat> a slimming consultant in Europe, 2,000 rupees per hour. A slimming consultant in India, 48,000 rupees per month. So there is a lot of money there. By and large, the feeling is that it, none of this works. So now let us go to the uh, alternative available to us, uh, which is Dixit diet. So this is the picture of Dixit. His name is Dr. Jagannath Dixit, <clears throat> and he's an associate professor of PSM. What is PSM? Preventive and Social Medicine. That is one terminology. Now, some people would call it public health or whatever. <clears throat> in Government Medical College in, in Aurangabad, Maharashtra. Earlier, he was in Latul. <clears throat> and his advice is free. Okay. <clears throat> his advice is very simple. And what is that advice? You eat two meals only in a whole day. And in between, only water. Okay, this is the advice. Or sometimes this is called intermittent fasting. He is not the first one to recommend it. Others have also recommended. But he somehow caught the attention of the society. So his plan has become very popular. He has many uh, lectures recorded on YouTube. You can check. And millions of people have viewed them. And there are, he, ha, he has his favorite WhatsApp groups and there are thousands of people uh, who are trying to follow his, his, his uh, diet plan uh, in those WhatsApp groups. And the claim is there is up to 8 kilogram loss in 3 months. Cost is zero. It's only your discipline. Not everybody is happy about this. For example, Maharashtra IME. What is IME? Indian Medical Association. These are the allopathic medicine uh, union. 
For example, this man, Dr. Subhash Pingre, is the secretary. What does he say? He says there are real dangers with this diet. Where does the danger come? If you Gandhi used to fast for 10, 20 days also. Where is, the danger is if diabetic patient does it, then he can be then he can be in trouble. <clears throat> so, what is the serendipity? By and large, people will tell you that if you follow the Dixit diet plan, there is some benefit in terms of lose, loss of weight. What is the serendipity? Many people reported that diet helped them reduce weight. That was as expected. That's not serendipity. But some reported that it helped them in their struggle against diabetes. That is the serendipity. Accidental discovery, which is very desirable. <clears throat> Diabetes is a very serious threat to Indian public health. Some people call India the diabetes capital of the world. They say there are 30 million, 10 crore diagnosed patients of diabetes. <clears throat> and it's a chronic problem. You cannot cure it. And it leads to degeneration of body. Gradually, your kidneys don't work, your eyes don't work, etc., etc. So it's a serious problem. And the only way to, you have to manage it. You, so far, nobody knows how to conquer it. Not like cholera. If you get cholera, you, you swallow antibiotics and you are cured. Not like that. Here, you have to have discipline. And if you do not live a disciplined life, then your degeneration becomes quicker. Okay. So what do doctors say? The first question they ask is, is this evidence-based? And that's a very fair question. Is there evidence? So far, the evidence we thought was anecdotal. That means XYZ said, his diabetes was controlled. PQRZ said my diabetes was controlled and so on and so forth. So doctors say there are no studies mentioned in PubMed. What is PubMed? It's a, it's a uh, uh, source on, on Google where you can get uh, references to. I am sorry. Uh, I can't switch off that phone because I'm using it for... for uh, internet connection. Okay, so you don't see any research published on on this on this uh, effect of uh, Dixie diet. Now, Dr. Mohan Agashi, who is equally famous for his, his uh, psychiatry and his uh, uh, stage and cinema performance, he says, we need scientific validation, which is fair. Then, who is this? Dr. Vijay Varad. He says, in, your, in the last lecture, uh, Srinivas Bogle talked about randomized control trials. So that is called the gold standard in medicine. If you do some research using randomized control trial, then that the results have to be believed. Okay. So you should have a randomized control trial. Some healthy obese people, some diabetic people, and then some of them get... Uh, Dixit diet, others don't get Dixit diet. This would be called a random. That is what we want. That's what they are saying. And they are fair. The guy says such a study is difficult. It is not feasible to administer a diet plan at a population level. I will not do it. So you have you need volunteers. And it is a difficult thing. So people don't volunteer. Okay. <clears throat> And once they join, will they continue with the discipline? We don't know. Okay, so we don't really understand how genetics and diet and, and diabetes, all these interact. But uh, so far, our understanding of the fundamental science is weak. Therefore, koi bhi aata hai aur bolta hai ki mere paas hai uh, medicine. So now we will talk about an attempt to take the Dixit diet idea into scientific investigation. And these two people are trying to do it. They are both doctors, uh, Sham Ashtekar and Ratna Ashtekar. They are a husband and wife couple. <laughs> and they are social workers as much as they are doctors. So they live in Nashik and, and try to serve society at large. I have known uh, Shyam Ashtigar since he was an MD student. So I, I remember he came to me for help in uh, analysis of his, his MD thesis. <clears throat> so they have organized the study. They have been really working very hard on this. 
and they will write research papers based on that work. It is their study. It is their idea. All rights are theirs. I don't have any rights on this. I and my colleague, Dr. Paranjabe, we are their statistics consultants. So I'm kind of running ahead of the story and I'm sharing with you uh, some of the things that we found as statisticians, but the data I'm going to show is not really genuine. It is kind of cooked up, partly. Right. So, <clears throat> so the first thing we found was that randomized control trial is not possible. Okay? A diet plan is a voluntary thing. You cannot force anybody. What is randomization? Randomization means uh, you have volunteers and you toss a coin and you say, ah, head agaya, you have to follow the shit diet. Tail agaya, you have to follow normal diet. Nobody will listen to you. This randomization is not possible. Another thing is blinding. Uh, blinding means, see, again, uh, Srinivas Bogle was talking about placebo. What is a placebo? No drug, but Nobody should know who is getting no drug and who is getting the experimental drug. How do you do that? You give them both a capsule. But placebo capsule contains only sugar, etc. Now, such a thing cannot be done for uh, diet. How can you hide it from the patient? So, blinding is not possible. So, all the normal tenets of designing a good medical trial are impossible here. And remember, Fisher all his life continued to develop methods to take care of such difficulties. You should look at everything you study in statistics, especially the things that Fisher did as solutions to problems of ground reality. So if a randomized trial is not possible, then we should do something called a quasi-experiment. <clears throat> Well, we just monitor those who choose to follow diet, the diet plan and monitor those who don't. Now, here we don't have randomization. We, we don't have any controls. That is why it is not an experiment. It's a quasi-experiment. So this is a possibility. What is observational study? No intervention. Okay. What is the variable of interest? The term in medicine is endpoint. And here it is for, for diabetes, it is HbA1c, not sugar. It's an indicator of long-term sugar control. It reflects cumulative history of three months. It reflects chronic sugar problem. It correlates with risk of long-term diabetes, etc. So if the HbA1c value is high, it means you have a problem, serious problem. Okay. All right. What are the right values for, for HbA1c? If you are no, normal, then range is 4 to 5.6%. Pre-diabetes, RHI, RHI, wake up call, 5.7 to 6.4. Diabetes, 6.5 and higher. So we understand what the values mean. All right. So let us see whether we exit diet. Uh, HbA1c comes down to 6.5 or 6.4. So we have two groups of diabetic subjects. One under conventional allopathic medication. That means they take insulin, whatever, whatever. Second, we dictate diet. We have not chosen. They have chosen. That's why it is not a randomized trial. And measure HbA1c before and after three months. This is called the trial plan. Okay. This is what nobody teaches us in design of experiments in statistics. That is my complaint against teaching of design of experiments. Because the most important part is the trial plan. And nobody teaches us what a trial plan is, how you make it. So what do we check then? We measure HbA1c reduction for those with diet, HbA1c reduction for those without diet, and compare, we want greater reduction. Okay, so null hypothesis is no difference. Alternative is that with Dixit diet, your reduction value is bigger. So we have told you how to conduct a trial. We have told you how to analyze the data. 
two sample t test then what happened this is the this is the part which is not taught huh? when the, the design of experiments people start talking about crd rbd that is nonsense that comes much later this is the fundamental thing okay what are the problems in trial <clears throat> now um, sham astekar and his wife are not medical researchers they are medical social workers doctors but they practice medicine for the good of tribal let us say or rural people okay so they did not know that you need to register when you want to do a medical experiment you register with the regulator of the of, of medical research so when we said you have to register they said fine no problem so they went and registered okay then you have to decide the sample size now this is the most important matter for all experimenters and this is where everybody comes to statisticians and this is what is not seriously taught in statistics courses this is my second major complaint that every student of statistics should know how to calculate sample size it is a very difficult thing not easy but we must know about it and in this case it was decided by the doctors that they will have group size of 300 it was not our recommendation but if they are willing to take a large sample size we have no complaint what is the cost of this statistics teachers never tell you about the cost of a of an experiment huh? so people are volunteers so there is no cost but to measure hba1c in the blood the laboratory pathological laboratory will take money and therefore that is the cost and that is not trivial it is substantial so you want to keep down how many times you measure hba1c and the idea of people was twice beginning of the study end of the study so that the cost is minimum there we again intervene we say ye nahi chalega we absolutely have to have an intermediate value because we want to know how things are changing they said kya farak padta hai kya farak padta hai so i had to give a lecture to doctors okay <clears throat> so now if you can see this this uh, <clears throat> uh, figure you are at the origin and you want to go to this point okay and you can go linearly you can go concave that means quick first and then slow afterwards or convex slow first and fast afterwards any of this is possible if you have only two end point values measured you will not know which of the curve you have what does it matter well if it is a straight line it means the reward is proportional to effort okay and you need different kind of psychology for this if it is the top line then initially as soon as you start you will get tremendous results and people will have unreasonable expectation whereas eventually things will flatten out on the other hand if you have the last thing then initially results will be very poor okay and people will be unhappy many would leave they will have to be told no no wait wait eventually every pass moksh mil jayega ant mein so the counseling has to be very different depending upon which of the curves therefore <clears throat> you cannot fit a curve to two point data you need at least three points ha ah, now change orientation means in our case we want hba1c to reduce so the picture will be the other way around linear decline same reduction every day every week every month sharp decline initially then slow decline that is one kind or slow decline first and sharp decline in the end we have to know which of these is our is our response okay what are the trial design problems there are a lot of people who follow dikshit diet and they will be willing to they are anyway disciplined people they are willing to offer themselves as subjects but normal uh, diabetes patients have no interest in helping you why should they help you what is what is in it for them nothing so it was difficult so fir kya kiya if you can't do anything else except whatever is possible this is not a valid design for a randomized control trial I agree no randomization possible it's not an experiment it is an observational study and then came corona so nothing was possible okay 
<clears throat> we have to stop everything. All right. So whatever data people gathered had to be analyzed. So what is the null hypothesis once again? The reduction in HbA1c is the same whether you do Dixit diet or you are on uh, normal insulin-based control. Alternative, better reduction for Dixit diet. This is a one-way uh, alternative or one-sided alternative. Now, earlier I said that we'll apply to sample t test. Now somebody says, nah, 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 this is not valid. Here, the matter of assumptions comes into the picture. Statisticians or statistics students sometimes pay no attention to assumptions, but those can be critical. What are the assumptions? Each is a random sample. Each comes uh, the, from normal distribution and both have the same variance. If at all, there is a difference in the mean. These are the assumptions. But our two groups of subjects may not be similar. I mean, in extreme case, one is all males and another is all females. So, what will we In fact, the change in HbA1c may be affected by gender, by age, how old your diabetes is, heredity. Do your parents have diabetes? Duration of treatment. How long have you been taking the treatment? So, the two samples are not similar. And therefore, a two-sample t-test is not valid. These are the kinds of problems where statisticians have to be ready, not only for discussing, but offering expert advice. So change the status. What will we These things are called confounders. That means uh, they confuse you about whether it is an effect of the treatment or whether it is because of something else. All right. I cannot choose subjects. I cannot take care at the design stage. So you have to adjust at the analysis stage. And this means this is the power of multiple regression analysis. OK, now I know undergraduates may not study multiple regression, but perhaps you study simple linear regression with one independent variable. But in real life, in lots of situations, you have to take multiple uh, independent variables in our case gender and age and how old is the disease and whether your parents have diabetes all these are independent variables okay so here is an end. how do you take age well just x1 is a you are 50 years old so 50 gender this is called nominal uh, variable how to code it so zero if female one if male or you could do zero with male one if female that will change the interpretation of the regression coefficient. And this is a very important matter. And again, in teaching, this is not really paid much attention to. Duration of disease, X sale, do sale, teen sale, whatever, so many months, whatever. Duration of treatment, again, you know, six months, three months, two months, whatever. Is parent diabetic anybody? Zero if nobody is diabetic in, in your parents, and one if only one, two if both die. Asa kuch coding karte this is called coding. more complicated situation <clears throat> but first column tells you the, the factors and last column tells you the p-value so age in years what is the p-value uh, oh again i'm not sure whether teachers tell you about p-value if you live with only 0.05 and 0 0.01 then you are not doing a justice to your your subject you have to understand what is a p-value and i will not go into it please ask your teacher to explain what is a p-value? This is important. Hardly anybody uh, talks about just 0 0.05. <clears throat> if the p-value is small, then the null hypothesis is rejected. What is the null hypothesis here? You have multiple regressions. You have regressor variables. And <clears throat> null hypothesis is that regression coefficient is zero. And that regressor variable has no impact on whatever you are measuring. So in case of this data, <clears throat> A p-value for age is 0.213, so that's very large, and we will say age doesn't seem to have any effect on the 
वॉट इज द सेकेंड वन एच बी एवं सी एट विजिट वन मतलब आपका हाल क्या था ट्रीटमेंट शुरू करने के पहले वेल पी वैल्यू इज वेरी स्मॉल जीरो इज नॉट जीरो मे बी द नॉन जीरो वैल्यू इज इन द फोर्थ प्लेस और वट एवर दैट मीन्स दिस वेरिएबल इज इम्पॉर्टेंट सो इफ इफ यू आर इन ए वेरी बैड कंडीशन then you are more likely to get benefit that is what this says uh, gap v last minus v1 v last is last visit v1 is first visit so it is the duration for which you are getting treatment and here p value is large so that also doesn't seem to have any effect <clears throat> diabetes duration kitne saal se aapko diabetes hai here the p value is 0.083 now should we treat that as significant or not so those who are rigid about 0.05 will say this p value is bigger than 0.05 not significant i recommend against that in this exploratory stage even this i will consider uh, as enough to say that diabetic duration probably has something to do uh, with with the effect now what is arm arm means two treatments Uh, dixie diet versus no and that difference is very significant uh, you can see that gender has no no effect uh, diet type has no effect matlab vegetarian non vegetarian parents hai kya usko bhi kuch effect nahi hai so this is what we found okay so age is not significant <clears throat> distance from the target significant you want to go to 6.5% or something like that if you are way above then you have a better benefit duration of treatment not significant duration of disease marginally significant and dixie diet is highly significant uh, and other things are not significant and ye humko mil gaya multiple regression se okay what is next <clears throat> this was for people who were on dixie diet for 3 months but there was a sub group which was on dixie diet for much longer period maybe even 6 months so we decided to look at those data differently 500 days that means about 2 years that's a long term okay will we know something more about it <clears throat> now this is i'm introducing a new term called spaghetti plots okay this is textbooks this is very common in uh, clinical trial literature it is well plot the points for every subject separately bas and see the time trend and here it is so each line represents one subject and what is hba1c was at the beginning and what happened and if you look at all this what is that red line it is 6.5 so roughly speaking below that you are not uh, diabetic above that you are kind of diabetic this thresholds are bit problematic but they are simple to to understand so what is the overall impression i get here so these are all subjects near 6.5 a little bit higher a little bit lower by and large things don't change by and large okay thoda aage piche hota hai kabhi badhta bhi hai hba1c kabhi ghatta bhi hai but by and large things don't change this is the message from this these are the short term fellows number of days or these are the people no no it's not short term some are even 500 but they are all close to 6.5 borderline people so borderline people don't seem to get much benefit this is one suggestion of this picture ah now we have another picture here also the x axis is number of days duration of the treatment but the y axis story is very different uh here on y axis you have values going from mm, 5 to 17.5 okay and i am going to say something about this picture and i hope you will agree with me initially everybody each line is a patient remember initially for about 200 days the hba1c declines about 200 and after that there is a flattening this is the the, the message from this picture okay so it looks like 
while coming back to the borderline between diabetes and non diabetes you are declining and after that uh, the, the the diet doesn't seem to give you ah, i have enlarge this picture now i hope you can see this fellow 31 is the uh, patient number he had 17.5 hb ones which is very high in about 200 days uh, it came to about 14 uh, in 300 days where is he i have lost that he he came nearly 6.6 .6 or something from 17 to 6 that's a great reduction okay and this seems to be the pattern so you see a lot of decline in HbA1c initially, and then gradually things flatten out. So what did we find? Number one, what is the problem? Remember in applied statistics, the most important thing is understanding the problem. What is the problem? Problem is I am diabetic, and I'm taking Dixit diet, and is my diabetes controlled? This is the question. What is the normal way of investigating such questions? Randomized control trial. What is the story here? You cannot do it. Why? Because there is no blinding possible, no randomization possible. So what have we done? We have simply taken data from whoever was doing it should die. Okay. Then what did we find? That if your diabetes is serious and if you continue with this diet, then presumably from very serious diabetes, you seem to come down to the borderline between diabetes, not diabetes. What is the benefit? You are still diabetic, but the risk of complications goes down. All right, so let me, this is a innovative kind of, or maybe even traditional uh, way of treating and I have done such investigations for other things also some Ayurvedic medicine some Yunani medicine and this is a peculiar thing I have found that people who are in love with that that method will tell you that this is the magic bullet 100% cure my discovery is that that is not true then is that recommendation totally useless and I have repeatedly found that these recommendations often have good, reasonable, but not dramatic benefit. So what is in the end? Are you here or there? And my recommendation is that for chronic diseases, for problematic situations, if there are traditional prescriptions, adopt them as a default. Don't immediately go and take some very powerful Western medicines. See whether these traditional medicines, homeopathy, Ayurveda, Siddha helps. And if it turns out your experience is that it doesn't help, then go to Western medicine. So that is the end of the presentation. But again, by way of conclusion, applied statistics is very much in demand today. But applied statistics requires that you understand the discipline in which to apply statistics. In today's college and university world, statistics students do not study any discipline in which to apply statistics. Therefore, my recommendation to you is, please identify an area in which you would like to work. Are you interested in banking, insurance? Then read about that, even if it is not part of your syllabus. And most important part in application is understanding the question. Then selecting a statistical method then getting some data. Oftentimes, statisticians have no control on getting the data. Oftentimes, there, there are uh, matters of cost. There are matters of rights. People willing, not willing. Data is not easy. Given that I have X1, X2, SN, are kisne given diya tumko? Or the real life problems arise. Based on whatever data is available, we have to come up with a reasonable recommendation. So this is the scenario of applied statistics in which many of you will enter. It is an exciting time. I have enjoyed it for the last 30 years. I am sure there is a lot of prosperity for people who can learn these tricks and deliver. Deliver what? You have to help the researcher in other disciplines. And that person must find out something that he was not able to find out alone without your help. If you can discover something new for him, then you have done a job. 
and if you are able to help such people, then your career is secure. So that is what I wanted to say. And let me thank uh, Madam Jyoti Shivalkar for organizing this activity. I am most impressed that this activity has been going on for 25 years. Let me tell you students that I know many, many colleges and very few colleges have teachers like this devoted uh, who will do things not required by the university, but who will do things which will improve the quality of statistics education. Perhaps you are aware the international assessment of quality of education in India is very bad. Judgment is 75% of the graduates in India are useless fellows. Uh, and the responsibility is on all parts. Uh, responsibility is partly on universities because they have a very strange way of looking at uh, study and examination. Responsibility is partly on teachers because they seem more interested in getting a salary than delivering education. And responsibility is on parents and students because they think that without hard work, without understanding, just because they have taken a course which is of interest in the market today, uh, you will get a good job. I assure you that we recruiters are bright people. We can make out whether a bachchan hai, अच्छा स्टडी किया है कि कॉपी किया है उसको समझता है कि नहीं समझता वी कैन मेक आउट इन हाफ एन आवर एंड इफ यू डोंट अंडरस्टैंड इफ यू आर नॉट बीन ऑनेस्ट इन योर स्टडी देन यू आर नॉट लाइकली टू मेक ए सक्सेसफुल करियर इन इन एप्लीकेशन सो लेट मी कॉम्प्लीमेंट ए रेरिटी अमंग कॉलेज टीचर्स टीचर्स हु आर डिवोटेड एंड हु विल टेक अप टास्क व्हिच आर नॉट रिक्वायर्ड नॉट इन द सिलेबस not required for examination i assured you that our examinations are not terribly useful for judging who knows the subject and who doesn't and all these extra curricular activities are very very important for delivering good statistics education and therefore let me compliment dr jyoti shivalkar i know her and i know her colleague uh, for many many years and i am really proud that some of our teachers at least a small fraction of our teachers are such devoted uh, people who want to deliver high quality education so thank you very much thanks sir for your compliment before we go on as an announcement please note that the youtube live class has been engaged If it's not, If it's visible, not visible or please send the page or the video. I hereby open the platform for question and answers by the audience. If you have any queries regarding the talk, the chat box is open for you guys. You can put up your questions in the chat box if you have any queries. So, so let me say something to the students. Now you are given a chance to ask a question, and typically in India, very few people have questions. But again, for a good career in applied statistics, let me give you a hint. And the hint is that you should always have questions ready. because when you are employed if there is a meeting and your ceo gives a lecture and then ask do you have any question and then if you don't have question he draws the conclusion that either you are dumb or you are insincere or you were sleeping none of this is very good for you so learn the trick of always being able to ask one sensible question whenever you attend a lecture keep a piece of paper and pencil as soon as you notice something you can ask about note it it should never happen that you don't have any question to ask it's a dangerous thing for a job in industry okay
so there's a question in the chat box by master akshar panchakshari so you said about taking interest in any world field how should one decide that field and take efforts toward it i mean to excel in it <clears throat> yeah one of the things is look for examples of applications right now for example dr srinivas bogle talked to you about the nobel prize in economics last year and it was given to abhijit banerji and his wife and he uses statistics in all his research in fact this year's nobel prize in economics is also given to economists who use statistics a lot in fact the entire research they are talking about is about connection between correlation and causation again dr bogle was talking about connect, connection between correlation keep reading good newspapers and good magazines times of india indian express uh what is it frontline india today perhaps the best magazine to read is the british one called economist but it may not be available to you but read these magazines and try to see what is statistical about articles appearing there pick up a subject i like biology read history of biology i was telling you story of uh, alexander fleming there are thousands of such stories and there are excellent histories of biology available read science fiction uh you have to read a lot more than what is in your syllabus and you can start with newspapers and magazines and then you have to go to books thank you sir guys any questions okay i guess there's none thank you sir for clearing it out i request ms nidhi lakhe to summarize us with the talk followed by the vote of thanks thank you riya good afternoon everyone here are the highlights of this session first of all dr anil gore sir told us about the applications of statistics and also the scope of statistics in future he told us about the stat he told us that statistics is applied in every domain of life and we should have a knowledge about it he then started his topic with odd which is obesity diabetes and dikshit diet and serendipity serendipity translates to a phenomenon of finding an unplanned fortunate discovery and the word serendipity is derived from a sanskrit word called swarnadeep he then told us about the experiment of alexander fleming uh, in which he then he then told us about the experiment of alexander fleming in which he discovered penicillin he then told us about the traditional knowledge and how it was used for great discoveries in the history he also told us about a surprising thing that fungus formed on the formed on the bread can be used for treating wounds then he explained us about the medicine of malaria treatment which is the cinchor tree water which is bitter in taste and can treat the disease of malaria he then talked us about obesity in which he told us about the business people are doing in the name of diet plan fake ads which companies are showing to sell their products then he started with dr jagannath dikshit diet plan for diabetes in which he told us about in which he told us about that it require a lot of disciplines and not money to follow this diet over 30 million people suffering with diabetes in our country india is known as the capital of diabetes and to control this we need to follow a diet with all disciplines he then told us about dr sham and ratna ashtakar who took an attempt to take dikshit diet into scientific research in which they did a quasi experiment which basically includes deep observation of the person taking this diet in this we need to check the hba1c amount in the person's blood which concluded that people having hba1c from 4% to 5.6% fall under the normal range 
people with HbA1c from 5.7% to 6.4% has a chance of getting diabetes and people with HbA1c 6.5% and higher are suffering with diabetes. Comparing HbA1c before and after diet shows us the clear shows us the clear result which is the basic idea of Dixit diet. He then told us about the problems arising while performing the trials. First problem was registry, registration is needed before every trial. The second one was target targeting count sh should be decided for sampling size. The third problem was cost of experiments, including lab charges, need to be specified before the research. He then explained us a curve in which the straight line is, prop is proportional to the effort taken. The concave curve rewards the big, rewards big initially and then planes out. And at the end, the concave curve, the convex curve is shows the reward is delayed. He then uh, told us the analysis uh, in which he told us about the null hypothesis in which reduction in HbA1c should be similar to both the arms. Change in strategies. The whole result of the entire Dixit diet and the experiments performing after them was the result concluded they observe a change in weight loss and HbA1c is reduced. He then told us about the spaghetti plots which shows the time trends. The basic conclusion of the entire experiment and the Dixit diet was people falling below 6.5 HbA1c are not diabetic and people above 6.5 HbA1c HbA1c are diabetic. Thank you. Thank you, Srishti. Thank you so for this amazing talk. It surely would have been a great idea to me. It said books are your best friends, no matter what. The knowledge they provide will always stay with you and never leave you. Moving forward, we have a book being released on the occasion of National Level Statistica 2021 and on the eve of 25th year of Statistica. Do it yourself, an activity book for undergraduate students of statistics authored by Dr. Vrinda Joglekar and Dr. Jyoti Shivalkarma. For the same, I invite Professor Rao Madam to release this book. I also invite Joglekar Madam, Shivalkar Madam, Bhanu Ma, and Naseri Madam to accompany Rao Ma in releasing this book. Ma'am, please. Speaker or uh, is not on, I think, madams, and we are not seen. Okay. Huh. Thank you, ma'am. I now invite Rao ma'am to share her reviews. <clears throat> and you are not audible.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Is it audible now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. At the outset, I wish to congratulate the authors of the book, Dr. Runda Joglaker and Jyoti Shivalkar. I am proud to say that they are my former students, and this is one of those moments that a teacher always cherishes. This book titled Do It Yourself will help you students understand the relevance and real life situation of the theoretical concepts that you study in your curriculum. There are unlimited opportunities for students of statistics out there in the job market. Statistics is used in almost all fields of human knowledge and skills like business, commerce, economics, social sciences, politics, planning, medicine, natural life sciences, etc. But it is unfortunate that in the curriculum of many universities, the focus is mainly on the theoretical experts and there is less focus on the application part of it. Hence, most students dry a black, blank face when they are asked questions on the application part in interviews. As teachers, we have to make up for what is not there in the curriculum. Dr. Joglekar and Dr. Shivalkar have done just that. Both the authors have tried the problems given in the book with their students and have got very successful results. It is activities like the ones given in the book that will stimulate the students' interest in statistics and help them gain confidence in their statistical skills. It is exposure of this kind that will pave the way for our students to enter the premier universities and colleges and the top organizations. I once again take this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Joglekar and Dr. Shivalkar. I admire their dedication, commitment, sincerity, and passion towards their profession. I commend their desire to give the best to their students. I can without hesitation say that the Department of Statistics in Hislop College is the place of academic excellence, and the credit goes to these two teachers. May their tribe increase. May this book reach the students of every student of statistics. It will do them a lot, whole lot of good. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your appreciation. I would also like to invite Doblekar ma'am to share her review from other point of view. Ma'am, please. Good afternoon, everybody. As a student, and then as a teacher, I found that uh, students had statistics phobia and considered statistics as an abstract science, though it is used on almost all walks of life. So to make students learning process more interesting and more fun filled, I tried to develop statistics activities that would enhance statistics knowledge and understanding. One of these was statistics quiz, StatStorm, and the other was this workshop Statistica. We are happy to share that uh, this um, uh, book is an outcome of this small initiative that I started in my department in Hislop College. And I have been extremely lucky to have Dr. Jyoti Shivalkar as uh, my colleague who realized the importance of experiential teaching and learning and supported me wholeheartedly. And 
now she has she is taking this um, process further and uh, single handedly uh, doing all these activities continuing with these activities i am really very happy uh, that she is doing that uh, with the support of the students who are really capable students project assignment is not a requirement of uh, undergraduate syllabus but still we started real life data collection and analysis projects in the department it was a not always a smooth sailing process we had our share of disappointments we had committed errors um, but we found that the activity enriched students as well as us as teachers and that was a huge motivation to continue we continued with this activity uh, day in our department every year we used to have one day as an activity day in our department where the students would perform uh, experiment um, uh, and then collect data uh, by performing experiments and uh, uh, we also had field activities some small level of course but field activities which led uh, to a ugc sponsored minor research project on this topic this book is an outcome of this minor research project the book is divided in two parts classroom activities which can be performed as experiments in the classroom to generate data Uh, which can be later analyzed by using statistics uh, tools and then the second part has field activities which included some interesting field surveys and uh, please remember that these surveys some of these surveys were relevant during that particular period when we were um, conducting these surveys they related to best of five at the uh, board examination etc so which were uh, really Uh, at that point of time they were very relevant and some opinion polls also we conducted in these uh, field activities writing this book has been an enjoyable journey uh, we uh, jyoti shivalkar and myself have been uh, colleagues but we really became very good friends and um, uh, dr anagha naseri also helped us in uh, so many ways we acknowledge the support of um, our uh, principal and uh, um, of course anagha naseri in this process we are happy that uh, the book is being released in the silver jubilee <laughs> silver jubilee year of the workshop statistica i never could realize or never could anticipate that this statistica workshop would continue for 25 years i am really very happy uh, today that uh, we could continue with this of course uh, with the help of jyoti it was always an enjoyable process dr bhanu and dr anagha naseri have been always with us in this process <clears throat> uh i am really very happy today that both of us are very happy today that the book is released at the hands of our beloved statistics teacher madam amen rao she has been our ideal when we entered teaching profession i acknowledge the presence of dr gore who has been a motivator uh, uh, uh one of the motivators who uh really helped us to continue uh, on this chosen path however today i miss our uh, another most important person in this journey and doctor <coughs> that is dr m n desh pande uh, who is not well today and i uh, wish him uh, a speedy recovery we do hope that this uh, do it yourself activity book will be useful to students and teachers of statistics 
as well as it will be a reference book for the research students of other disciplines. <clears throat> I am happy to share that the book will be available on Amazon shortly. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am, for your previous review. I will also, I could see a very loving Jyoti Shivalkar ma'am being happily emotional and every professor present here with us about this very interesting workshop. I should say we are blessed and lucky to be a part of this workshop. I wish a very hearty congratulations to everyone present here for the same. Here, I take an opportunity to thank Rao ma'am for sharing her valuable review and for reviewing the book. Joglikar ma'am for informing us about the contents of the book. Nasiri madam and Bhanu ma'am to accompany her in this book release function and for their precious presence and participating in the releasing book. This was really special for us. It will lead our students away to a new learning world through a book which is interesting and an engaging way to learn statistics. Here we will, we will take a short interlude and disconnect to connect soon for more upcoming exciting things for you. Everyone is requested to please note that the break is from 1.10 p.m. to 1.40 p.m. We will meet here and join again at 1.40 p.m. Please be on time for not missing out the fun in our session. Thank you. Uh, Ria, thank you for perfectly managing the schedule. So friends will meet at, we will meet after a short break of 40 minutes. Thank you, madam. Huh, Ma'am, your mic is on. Yes, ma'am, it's off now.
please note that the workshop will resume from 1:40 pm please be on time that's audible They may all of you join the next session. So Hello. Can someone tell me if I'm audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Pranav, will you present anything? How will you present? Karenge. Ah. Yes. Acha. Tell me. Uh, yeah. Tell me. Tell me. I am on the web. I mean, I am on the laptop. The web. So, will you present here? Now, check it once again. Better. Okay. Gore, sir, okay. will be joining soon for this session to review. Means uh, she will be present for the case study presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, Please present her. Banana. Do. Ah. I already present her, right? Ah. Two. I have just share. I mean, two. Just log in. Kiya. So you have probably one. Banana. Ah. These ones. This is not showing. Ah. One second. Banana. Do. One minute. Present her. Change. हो गया जस्टिस चेक कर लो एक बार स्क्रीन पूरी मेरी स्क्रीन विजिबल है हाँ विजिबल है अच्छा प्रणाम यस मैम यू आर यू आर इंट्रोड्यूसिंग नेक्स्ट स्पीकर ना यस मैम आफ्टर द केस स्टडी सुमादन सर एंड आर यू एबल टू मैनेज योर केस यस यस मैम यस मैम नो वरीज नो वरीज मैम इसमें वॉइस ऑडिबल यस यस सी लिसन Uh, when Ria will uh, say, uh, Ria will invite the first case study. 
केस स्टडी वन होने के बाद एनी क्वेश्चन uh, पूछना है केस स्टडी में हाँ ये सर नो एम आई ऑडिबल अच्छा ठीक है अच्छा ठीक है ठीक है अच्छा ओके देन ठीक है वन मिनट तो वो होने के बाद देन सेकंड रिया विल इंटर इंटरवीन और द सेकंड केस स्टडी विल स्टार्ट इमीडिएटली आई वांटेड टू नो दैट मैम आई वुड स्टैंड टू फर्स्ट टीम एंड देन अनाउंस फॉर द सेकंड ओके 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 दैट्स ओके दैट्स गुड सो बी रेडी नाउ हां डोंट चैट हां यस मैम आई जस्ट वांटेड टू नो व्हिच टीम विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग फर्स्ट फर्स्ट अपन ने दिला दिया है ऑनलाइन टीम मैम नहीं yes ma'am ma'am i'll be sir then covid 19 okay okay ma'am and we have to catch up uh, mr samadhan gubade's uh, my story at 215 okay so fast nahi karna hai do it slow aaram se hoga dono case studies but uh, we will follow the program minute to minute okay try to follow minute to minute okay what about pranav you can, can you present the screen Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I can. So, backdrop, Ramak. Yes, ma'am. Am I just screen visible? Yes, the screen is visible. Yes, it is.
Yes, you are. Is the first team ready? Yes, ma'am. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, let me check, sir, has joined or not. Gore, sir, is expected. Yes, I have joined. Okay. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, case, uh, case study one. First case study can start. Ria? Am I audible? Yes. Ma'am, shall I start or will Ria be making an announcement? Ria will make an announcement. Let her. Ria, are you there? Ria. Good afternoon, everyone present here. I hope the break would have refreshed and boosted you up for the session further. Before moving on, I have a question for you all. What does the words like research, analysis, investigate, study, cases, etc. sounds to you like? Exciting and a sense of what's next, right? Let's break the suspense and understand the case study on online teaching learning students perspective and COVID-19 vaccine efficiency by the students of Islop College Nagpur, who has given their all to these case studies to present the best before you. I request our team one presenting on online teaching learning students perspective by Master Pranav Kilnani, Ms. Catherine Shendre, and Ms. Isha Agrawal to take up the platform. Okay, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, uh, wait, I'll present. Just a second. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay, 
Armstrong. A very hearty good afternoon to the esteemed dignitaries, teachers, and my dear friends. Today, I'm here with a very interesting case study, students' preference on online teaching and learning. First of all, let me start by telling you, as soon as the pandemic began, with actually no option left, government made decision for classes and exams to be conducted online, and students simply had no choice other than attending. They were forced to make this drastic change, and there was no way out. So, we decided to take their opinion on how effective online classes are proven to be for them, and what are the factors that affect them, the limitations, and after the data was collected, we analyzed and came up with some amazing observations, not to ignore the fact that it was very difficult for teachers as well, but this case study specifically is based on the student's opinion. Before we begin, let me tell you all that all of this started with a notice board problem given by Jyoti Shivalkan Ma'am way back in January. We were asked to form a questionnaire for the students, asking them about their experience with the online mode. Out of all, six questionnaires were selected by Ma'am and a team was made to make a final one. After having made the final questionnaire, we made a Google form link with all the questions, did pilot survey, and after finalizing everything, the form was ready to be sent for survey. The form was circulated, and we were able to get a total of 515 responses. Among the 515 students, 327, that is 63.5% were females, and 188, that is 36.5% were males. We then analyzed the data and gave it for a college maximum. Now we are ready with the case study. So the objective of the survey was to explore student perception of online teaching learning, to understand the student experience of learning online. I'll now throw some light on how the classes were conducted here at Hislop College. Classes were very organized and regular. Students were given just one MS Teams link for all the classes to avoid the everyday confusion. Different teachers used different methods for teaching. Some teachers used PDF. Some used pen tablet. Some also taught live using webcam. YouTube live classes also took place, which gave the students advantage of watching it again, just in case they missed anything. To keep a check on students' progress, unit tests were conducted on a regular basis. Now, the survey included a total of 13 questions. They were as follows. Please take a look. After having received the data, we analyzed it with the help of MAM and we were able to draw out some stunning observation from the data collected. We began analyzing the data by classifying it into two groups of male and female, but the results came out to be very shocking. Let's have a look at the following tables. The very first table tells us about the device used by the students. The data would definitely astonish the university as they have been thinking all of this while that the most of the students attend the class with laptop or PC. But we also found out the proportion of male, female and overall and we can see how close the results are. I am of the opinion that online classes take a lot out of you. You need to sit at one place for hours and keep looking at the screen and concentrate write notes, and much more. And yes, all of this with actually no amusement, no jokes, and no friends by our side. While some believe this, some have completely different opinion. Let's have a look at the below table. We can see that there is not a lot of difference between people saying yes and people saying no. And interestingly, the male, female, and overall proportion came out to be the same. Our next question was about the preference on which mode was more effective and impactful for the learning and exams. The table below shows the results, with almost every result coming out to be so close. This was no stunner. Here as well, the proportions were exactly the same. And the very next question was, after taking into consideration everything, every pro and con 
if you were given a choice between the two mods, which one will you choose? And with slight difference in proportions of male and female, it was still relevant that more than half of us were offline classes to begin, and that it is more impactful to us in many ways. So, as we can see that the proportions are quite similar and almost equal, we decided that we will not classify and divide, but concentrate on the respondents as a whole. We also have conclusions to some of the questions in pie charts. This pie chart is about how students found their online classes to be. Let's have a look. It was good to see that only a mere 8% of students rated their online classes on the negative side, while the majority of the respondent is rated it positively. The next pie chart is a significant one. It tells us about the chances of students understanding a co concept in class. Around 86% of sample students were able to understand the concept in class itself. This question of the questionnaire help us conclude and analyze the survey. It asks the student to rate their satisfaction on the scale of one to five. The responses to this question told us a lot about the online mode. We found out the weighted arithmetic mean and it came out to be 3.21. It was awful that the overall score was 3.21 as we had positive responses for the most of the questions, but it drew us to the conclusion that there are many other factors and interests this result and influence the learning and overall experience in online mode. Have a look at this table. Both are the same, but the table number five is the actual numbers and table number six is in proportions. So here are some noteworthy observations from our study. Proportion of students who use their phone for attending online class is 0.72. Proportion of students who feel that online classes are more exhaustive came out to be 0.56. Proportion of students who find examination and study more impactful in offline form calculated out to be 0.62. Proportion of students who prefer offline mode for learning was 0.66. Proportion of students understanding the concepts in class itself was found to be 52% for almost, for always and mostly, and 34% for sometimes. We calculated the average score on a five point scale for the satisfaction level about online teaching and learning based on the ratings given by the respondents, which was found to be 3.21. Now let's discuss some of the limitations in the online mode. The online mode of the learning come with a lot of limitations and drawbacks, such as network issue, the difficulty to write down notes simultaneously, the hesitation to put doubt forward in class, teachers' inability to write down big problems due to space constraint, power failure sometimes, and much more. So, what did we learn by conducting this survey? What was the conclusion? By conducting the whole survey, we were able to establish the fact that no matter how good the faculty, teaching techniques, and well equipped we are with the technology, in no way can we replace the live classes with the online mode, even though it is being widely accepted across the globe, but the impact teachers teaching live in the classes has on students and the exposure of these students get isn't quite possible in the online mode. Hence, even when the answers to our questions mostly had positive responses, the overall experience calculated by finding out weighted arithmetic mean came out to be 3.21 from 5. The students also marked that they would opt for offline classes when given a choice between the two, which pretty much tells that we all want the offline classes back. The further case study was done by our senior, Isha Agrawal. So now she will take over. Thank you, Pranav. In the initial descriptive analysis, 
my junior friends by finding the percentage of related categories for male and female have shown that there is not much difference observed in the almost all the responses of the questionnaire here i am dealing with the inferior part of the survey in this presentation i am considering some interesting percentage found in the descriptive analysis part and by find carrying out the large sample test for testing specified value a proportion and constructing related 100 into 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval i will summarize the result of this survey we have used desired level of significance as 5% and degree of assurance as 95% next first the type of device used for attending online classes here the observed sample proportion is 0.72 for mobile phones then i carried out the large sample test for h0 where p is equals to specified value as 0.75 against h1 where p is not equals to 0.75 and then i construct a related 95% confidence interval for p p is the population proportion of students who use their phone for attending online class p not is specified value of proportion sample size is 5 and 5 and pn as sample proportion 0.72 next here we wish to test the null hypothesis under h not the mod of calculated z is equals to 1.5723 because it is two field test we reject h not at 5% level of significance if its mod of calculated z is greater than z alpha by 2 which is 1.96 as a calculate mod of calculated z is less than 1.96 here we fail to reject the null hypothesis at 5% level of significance next next then i constructed 95% confidence interval for p which is 0.681 to 0.759 and all of us can see that a specified value 0.75 lies in this interval so the population proportion of students in hislop college who use their phone can vary to 68% to almost 76% next then we find that the proportion of students in the sample who feel that online classes are more exhaustive here the sample proportion is 0.44 if we denote the proportion of students in the hislop college who feel that online classes are more exhaustive we check whether h not p is equals to 0.5 against h1 p is less than 0.5 then i constructed 95% confidence interval for p Which is 0.39712 to 0.4828. Here we can see that a specified value doesn't lie between the confidence intervals. So here only we can say that we reject our null hypothesis or by performing tests. Next, we can see that our calculated z is minus 2.7235, and it is a left tail test with its Test, so we reject H not at five percent level of significance if the calculated Z is less than minus Z alpha. Here our calculated Z value is less than minus Z alpha since we reject null hypothesis at five percent level of significance. Next, then we consider if the proportion of students in the sample. Who find examination and studying more impact impactful in online form? Here the sample proportion is 0.62. If we denote the proportion of students in the Hoslop College who feel that offline form form is more impactful, we test whether H not P is equals to 0.65 against H1 P is not equals to 0.65. Then I constructed 95% confidence interval for P. Which is 0.59 to 0.66. Here we can see that a specified value lies lies between the confidence interval. So need no, no need to do further case study. Here only we can say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Next, 
then next we consider the percentage for if a choice is given which mode will you prefer offline or online if the proportion of students in the sample who prefer offline mode for learning for this the sample proportion is 0.66 if p denote the proportion of students in hislop college who prefer offline mode for learning we test whether h not p is equals to 0.75 against h when p is not equals to 0.75 and here i come across an interesting case where i found that the 95% confidence interval for p which is 0.62 to 0.75 then i came to know that a specified value is equal to the upper confidence limit so i carried out large sample test to check this case and surprisingly here because it is two tail test the mod of calculated z which is 1.98 it's slightly greater than 1.96 so one may can accept or reject this null hypothesis it totally depend on analytic how how we consider this border value because mathematically i observe that 1.98 is slightly greater than 1.96 i reject null hypothesis at 5% level of significance next further i consider the following table we are rating a sign on satisfaction level about online teaching learning as classified according to gender of respondents here we carried out chi square test for homogeneity to test the following hypothesis which is male and female population are homogeneous with respect to five rating on satisfaction level about online teaching learning next then i perform chi square test for homogeneity the calculated chi square value was 0.1084 and the table value of chi square for 4 degree for 4 degrees of freedom at 5% level of significance was 9.49 since the calculated value of chi square is less than the critical value here we fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that male and female proportion can be considered to be homogeneous with respect to the various rating on satisfaction level about online teaching learning next in a nutshell i am presenting the following table to summarize the result of this survey here all four questionnaires is given with respect to their sample proportion and confidence interval in percentage please have a look next overall since our sample size is quite large we can say that the survey result may hold good for similar kinds of colleges in nagpur so yeah we can generalize this result for colleges having arts commerce and science stream in nagpur thank you instructor thank you team thank you. that was really thank a wonderful you. presentation now i request master ronak pahuja master akshar bansakshari and master anup banerjee a team two to take up the platform from for presenting their case study on covid 19 vaccine efficiency by the students of hislop college nagpur is the screen visible yes yes it's visible anup am i audible yes yes okay. a very heartily welcome to one and all present here first of all i would like to ask few questions to everyone have anyone ever thought two years back that we will actually go into lockdown for months that the pandemic will have different waves 
that we will stuck at home and everything we have seen and been through together i myself have never imagined this when it all began but it did happen and here we are today with the first wave cases peaking in september and decreasing since then i thought this would be it and i guess even was as our colleges as well started we did enjoy going college had fun but life had di- different plans cases peaked again and with more deaths this time cities went under lockdown and here was the second wave fortunately there was a ray of hope as vaccines came up in our country hence everyone might be concerned about the efficacy of vaccines so here we are to present you the case study on the efficacy of covid-19 vaccines next introduction with first covid-19 case reported in wuhan china in december 2019 covid-19 quickly became a pandemic and global concern with millions of people getting infected and dying of this disease the world witnessed the collapse of numerous industries rising unemployment burden healthcare workers closure of schools and colleges suspended airlines and disrupted global supply chain researchers worldwide toiled day and night to develop a vaccine and within less than 12 months into the pandemic several scientists had developed vaccine to combat this disease or virus however the challenge was to make this this vaccines available to people around the world here are some more uh, some articles regarding same next first and the second wave for india the first wave and second wave was separated by about 6 months the peak of the first wave was in september was in september 2020 the daily cases decreased until february until then after first march daily cases exhibited a sharp increase which was marked as the beginning of second wave India was experiencing the second wave of COVID-19 pandemic it had affected the indian population at an alarming rate here we can refer this table from times of india article the covid curve here we can see the first wave peaking at september 2020 and the second wave peaking at uh, around april or may month next here we can see the india's worst covid hit month for first wave it was uh, in month august and september and for second wave it was and here are some more articles regarding same vaccination to counter the exponential increase in the number of cases government of india started vaccination drive with three vaccines covid shield also known as oxford extra zeneca's vaccine manufactured by serum institute of india covaxin manufactured by bharat biotech limited and sputnik 5 in phases the second phase of covid-19 vaccination drive to inoculate people above 60 years and those over 45 with comorbidities against the coronavirus began on march 1st at the outset the second wave in india looks much more precarious than the first wave although india is the fastest in the world to administer covid-19 vaccine doses the fraction of the vaccinated population is relatively small due to very large population of the country lastly unlike the first wave the current spread of the virus mutants has reached remote locations where healthcare services are not sufficiently adequate some of the articles when the corona of covid vaccination started 
objective of art study after devastating second wave people are curious to know the efficacy of covid-19 vaccines unfortunately there is no such transparent data released by government of india government is interested in vaccinating population 100% in near future no one had taken up the initiative to question the vaccine efficacy according to me government could have gone through a simple procedure of collecting data while covid-19 test like at the time of rt pcr they could simply ask people whether they are vaccinated or not and if vaccinated are they completely vaccinated or only had their first dose after that they could make this data public unfortunately there is no such data available from the government so we the students of statistics thought it's our responsibility to come up with a transparent data which will be helpful to draw some valid conclusions about covid-19 vaccine efficacy here is an article from the hindu newspaper vaccines out but data missing we can see in the covid shield section the efficacy data of phase 3 trials conducted on 1600 volunteers in 17 indian cities have not been made public yet same we can see in the covaxin and the next i would like to go in another article from the hindu india approves covid 19 vaccines covid shield and covaxin for emergency use neither covid shield a crucial phase 3 trial next i would like to move on on the article from the the new indian express efficacy vary but all covid 19 vaccines effective says expert next qualifies i wish to state that this case study is an academic exercise for us the missing point in our survey is that some people were not ready to share about their com- comorbidity also one data which we could not get from all the respondents is the gap between vaccination and the onset of corona in this survey the objective is not to prove or disprove anything with reference to this an article from times now digital efficacy of vaccine cannot be doubted says supreme court the supreme court refused to entertain a plea against covid-19 vaccination and said that efficacy of vaccine should not be doubted without any proof next data and procedure the study is based on the questionnaire based information collected from 606 persons in nagpur who found, who were found covid-19 positive after march 1 the date was selected the date march 1 was selected as the second phase of the covid-19 vaccination drive to inoculate people about 60 years and those after 45 with comorbidities against the corona virus began on march 1 along with this march 1 is also marked as the beginning of the second wave of corona virus in india first of all the question questions were framed and tested using a pilot survey then the questions were framed in a google form questionnaire and this questionnaire was used to collect the information from informants by the investigator themselves using telephonic conversations we could collect the required information from 606 person in nagpur it was not a random sample but a large sample of covid-19 sufferers who suffered from it after march 1 the question included nine following question one did you suffer from covid-19 after 1st march 2021 second were you vaccinated at the time when you suffered from covid-19 third did you suffer from covid-19 sorry for was there any hospitalization or emergency condition before vaccination 8 
did the person die due to covid 19 after first march 2021 ninth age of infected or deceased person next data and procedure from the beginning of the survey under the guidance of our teacher dr jyoti shivalkar ma'am our focus was on the accuracy therefore to avoid incorrect data we collected by interviewing people hence we connected our friends relatives and acquaintances personally and assembled their information as we could get a sample of vaccinated or non vaccinated persons who suffered from covid 19 after march 1st the survey was conducted from 25th september 2021 to 10th october 2021 in a span of 15 days we were able to collect data of 606 person who suffered from covid 19 after 1st march the data was collected to know the impact of vaccine on different age groups after gathering all the data the response sheet was generated in the form of excel sheet as this was an opinion poll so we haven't considered the comorbidity factor as we found the pe- that people hesit- hesitate to disclose information about the morbidity thank you for from to continue from now i would like my seniors to carry on this study thank you anup for such a great introduction as he said that we have recorded the responses in excel sheet so it is, here is a snapshot of it in total we had 606 responses in it next in our analysis we have calculated single sample proportion and difference of population proportion for large sample as here the total number of sample is 606 which is large the confidence interval calculated have 95% degree of assurance and 5% level of signification the population proportion are expected to lie in those intervals before moving to see detailed analysis let's see the basic one the number of people suffering covid after vaccination is 174 and that of suffering before vaccination is 432 hence the total 606 the age wise grouped distribution of people who suffered from covid after vaccination can be seen in the table given below as you can see it's a grouped grouped age distribution next number of vaccinated versus people who suffered after vaccination there were 432 people who were not vaccinated when they had covid 210 people were not vaccinated when they we, when we had survey 174 were suffered from covid after vaccination out of those who uh, out of those 174 people who suffered from covid after vac- after vaccination 124 were infected after first dose and 50 were infected after the second dose hey, here we calculated the sample proportion for those vaccinated people the sample proportion was 0.2871 which is a big number even for the sam- even for the large sample this carries us to the primary question are the vaccine effective before talking about the vaccine effectiveness talking about vaccine we saw that the most before talking about the vac- the effective vaccines let's see which vaccine was most more preferable and most available here we can see covid shield was most available and most preferable vaccine as it con- as it constitutes 70% and covaxin constituted approximately 23% and sputnik v 7% now coming to the point of effectiveness firstly we wanted to check the immunity level or am- amount of people who su- who were hospitalized without vaccination in our survey 58 out of 432 people who were not vaccinated while suffering from covid needed hospitalization we calculated sample proportion for that which was 0.1343 58 upon 432 13% hospitalization is not a big num- is a big number and also a concerning number if we imagine a population of 1 crore people 13% of means 13 lakh so it's a concerning number 
the population proportion of people who are not vaccinated and needed hospitalization lies between 10.2% to 16.6%. This is a huge number for hospitalization requirement when considering a large population. Shifting our focus to the vaccinated people, we check the sample proportion of people who suffered after the vaccination and needed hospitalization. The sample proportion came out to be 0.2816, which is a really large proportion when compared to the non-vaccinated ones. But here we are not considering the comorbidity and the time lag between the vaccination and infection. Since people were not able to share these informations, we couldn't take this into our calculations and these factors are vital towards this comparison. The 95% confidence interval for population proportion was 0.2417 and to 0.3484. It shows us that the chance after vaccination suffering from COVID-19 and getting hospitalized lies between 21.5 to 34.8%. We move towards the dose age-wise hospitalization count. Since we all have read the reports about vaccine being more effective after the second dose, we calculated the data for dose age-wise distribution and checked to see if we got a similar result or not. The sample proportion for hospitalization after second dose came out to be 0.2984 and the sample proportion for hospitalization after the second dose came out to be 0.24. This result was quite similar to the reports which were implying that the vaccine is more effective after the second dose. Now shifting towards the population percentage, we see that the chances of an infected person getting hospitalized after the first dose of vaccination lies between 21.8 to 37.9 percent, whereas the chances of an infected person getting hospitalized after the second dose is 12.16 to 35.83 percent. This concerns the fact that the vaccine is much more effective after the second dose. Now, what about the population proportion for casualties before and after vaccination? We had 396 vaccinated people in our survey, which included both infected before after vaccination and after vaccination. Out of these 396, 35 was the count of casualties and among 210 still not vaccinated at the time of survey, 19 was the casualty count. We calculated the sample proportions of people dying before and after vaccination. Here, the sample proportions came out to be T1, signifying the sample proportion of people dying after vaccination, which was 0.08383, and uh, T2 signifying the sample proportion of people dying before vaccination, which was 0.0904. We now calculated the 95% confidence interval for difference of population proportion with 5% level of significance. The confidence interval came out to be 0 minus 0 0.0498, 0 0.0456. Now, this results tell us that there is not sign no significant difference between the risk of death due to COVID before and after vaccination. But if we look in depth, here the deaths in vaccinated section consisted mainly of elderly population and senior citizens. And also, these was, uh, senior citizens were hospitalized prior to their vaccination. The comorbidity factors kicks in here too. But also, surprisingly in Kerala, there we can see that the people they are getting infected and also dying from COVID even after their vaccination. This gives us the insight not to completely reject this result. Now, moving towards these, uh, those casualties in which people were vaccinated before suffering from COVID. Out of the 174 vaccinated people, 29 died due to COVID. The sample proportion of the people who suffered from COVID after vaccination and died came out to be 0 0.1667 and the 95% confidence interval for population proportion came out to be 0 0.1112 to 0.222. Hence, the chance of a person dying from COVID after vaccination lies in between 11.1 to 22.2%. Again, here the comorbidity and the age factor kicks in. We have calculated proportions for casualty after vaccination, but what about the dosage wide distribution? Out of the 124 who had their first dose while suffering from COVID, 22 died, whereas the 57 died, the 50 after the second dose. We calculated the sample proportion for both of these cases. The sample proportion for people dying after first dose due to COVID came out to be 0 0.1112. 
1774 and the sample proportion of people dying after second dose of COVID came out to be 0.14. The sample proportion shows the improvement in capability of vaccine after the second dose as we expected and the vaccine is much, much more efficient after the second dose. Thank you, Akshar. Now, let's conclude our talk, conclude our study with some conclusions. The chance that a person suffers from COVID after vaccination lies between 25.1 to 32.3 percent. The chance of getting hospitalized after suffering from COVID post vaccination lies between 21.5 to 34.8 percent. The population proportion of that who got hospitalized after first dose of vaccination lies between 21.8 and 37.9 percent the population proportion of that who got of those who got hospitalized after second dose of vaccination lies between 21.16 and 35.83 percent the chance of dying due to covid after vaccination is more for a person with comorbidity issue the sample pro proportion shows the improvement and the capability of vaccine after the second dose Hence, the vaccine is much more efficient after the second dose. As such, scientists and experts have been saying that the vaccine is more effective after second dose. Now, how to conclude without saying that who who supported us? Means these are this is our this was our team who supported in collecting the data, and uh, we three and with the help of ma'am we studied the data and calculated these proportions and other calculations. A survey team included Riya, Anup, Catherine, Pranav, Atharva, Akansha, Srishti, my brother Akshar, me and my, uh, sorry, sorry, Bhumika. And thank you really for patiently listening to us. Thank you team for the magnificent presentation. I would like to request Dr. A.P. Gore sir to please share his reviews and his words of guidance for our budding statisticians. Sir, please. OK, <clears throat> let me begin with uh, case study one. And I have some three or four questions to ask. And the first question, because this is a project by statistics students is, you have five, 15 people, I guess. What population do they represent? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Uh, so uh, um, those 515 students were actually of Hitler College. And uh, yes, of different streams, but of Islam College. No, no, that was not the question. The question was, what universe, what population do they represent? Uh, so it actually represented uh, colleges like us, uh, though, uh, that has different streams. Like I guess, uh, uh, Dharampet Science has, uh, no, not Dharampet Science, like colleges that have dif uh, different streams, like Science, Commerce and Arts. So we, uh, this uh, survey was basically to infer that uh, other colleges, just like Islam College, that has uh, uh, different teams. So uh, students of all the other colleges, uh, like their uh, response to the online learning. Hmm. So did you select a random sample of students of your college? Uh, yes, sir. It was uh, totally random and. Uh... We respect their anonymity and confidentiality. We did not collect any uh, uh, like uh, like uh, their email IDs or anything. Uh, we just wanted to be a uh, data to be um, pure and yes, yes, that is. So my question was, did you select the sample randomly? So how? you say yes. So please tell me how you selected the individuals. Uh, how sir? many students do you have in your college? Uh, sir, let me add something. Uh, the, yes. In this Corona period, uh, students are not coming to the college, so yes. they could not actually uh, take it from MIS. Random sample, dear students, means sir wanted to know whether are you using any methods of the random sampling. Means uh, this is not a random sample in the sense you have sent a uh, uh, link to various groups, 
and who answered those um, uh, link who 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 responded you get the responses from them okay but in this corona it is difficult to collect the random uh, information by drawing the random samples so that's why they have i understand there is no problem about the difficulty the problem is since we know this is a non random sample do we have any idea whether there are biases you see as statisticians these are the questions you will be asked do you think that people who answered are different from people who did not okay think about this because this is my common observation that all over in statistics projects people take samples and do whatever they want with it but never ask themselves what they represent okay for example i would have asked is this, is yours a minority college yes not yes yes okay yes, sir so maybe it does not represent all colleges i mean this i am here to ask you questions to put into trouble yes sir so did you take into account the fact you wanted to represent all the colleges but your college itself is not representative okay so think about this this is what you will always be asked let me go to the yes, next sir. question next question sir we will definitely guess you have all kind of conclusions but i have a very simple question from your survey do you get any idea whether it is possible to improve whatever was being done sir i guess sir could you please repeat the question see you have studied some phenomenon in the society does yes. that study help you suggest how to improve i guess uh, uh, so actually the conclusion uh, says itself that uh, no matter how good uh, like we are well equipped with the technology or uh, like uh, we can be at a very best at online mode but uh, i guess it still has to say that it can't be replaced by the offline mode like uh, like i said the impact teacher no, no, that i understand like, i am asking you since you don't get a choice uh, when you are in trouble you have to go online is there some way by which online teaching can be improved yes sir uh, as the questionnaire was uh, some got trouble while studying in online so yes we can improve the techniques of teaching for How? that How? Uh, sir like some students are not able to understand in pdfs so the teachers using pen tablet so students are able to understand that so do you think you know that those who did not understand pdf would have understood by some other method may it's possible sir ah then that is not your conclusion that is your conjecture Yes. A very simple question. Why don't you put number on the slide? I can't even say on your fifth slide you said this. Every presentation, both the presentations, there is no slide number. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. So yes. you have got to yes. change that. Next question. In my lecture, I was saying that you need to know about domain. Ah, this is about education, right? did you at all discuss this question with any students of bachelor of education master of education or psychology your college has a, i think a big department of psychology right yes so statisticians are not expected to know how to evaluate a particular method of education but education people and psychology people do that did you discuss any of it with them I think the answer is no. Yes, sir. Actually, we prepared an online form. Look, so, don't avoid the question. 
question is did you discuss with education and psychology the answer is no that is bad you don't know anything about how to evaluate educational process you should have either read some books on how to evaluate or talked with people or talked with professors okay this is what i mean by domain expertise you don't have domain expertise and you have not made any attempt to acquire the domain expertise so it is possible that your questions were wrong okay next question in one case and i don't remember because you have no uh, uh slide numbers i can't refer where but in one slide your chi square value was 0.1 yes sir and the table value that you compared this one with was some 9 or something yes sir right now you are happy just to say calculated value less than tabulated value therefore everything fine this is a bad way to do applied statistics your value is so close to zero that it means your expected values and observed values are unbelievably close to each other this whenever this happens you should doubt correctness of the data and i will ask you to read fisher has written about mendel's experiment are you familiar with the name gregor mendel yes sir ah so the mendel's experiment was about peas and short and tall and all that and fisher said yes the chi square value is small uh, but the chi square value is so small that i believe it is not possible that chi square value is so small just by chance kuch gadbade he claimed that the people have cheated you should read about this very small chi square value does not represent support to null hypothesis okay sir and last thing is everywhere you go by 0.05 that is not acceptable you should cal always calculate the p value okay uh, that's all for case study Thank, Thank you, sir. We will surely try to improve. Okay. Now the COVID vaccine efficiency. The first point I have is that you write too much on your slides. Slides are not meant for writing long paragraphs. Slides should have only bullet points, and yes. slides should have a font size which is. visible your your lettering is so small i can't even read so that is an immediate need for sorry for that time next time yeah so my question again to you is have you consulted anything in google or internet which says how slides should be prepared no sir ah galat hai sir consulted ah you should have consulted yes sir it was a mistake you are not experts in slide preparation yes sir So Next I can understand that it was not visible. No, no, no. That is not a serious problem. The problem no, is nobody thinks that they should try and find out what is the best way to prepare slides. Everybody thinks they are experts. Sir, we are humans. We can make mistakes. No, no, no. This is not about being human. This yep, is about yep. not consulting what is available on Google. Yes, sir. That okay. was. next is when you present try avo avoid reading what is on the slide otherwise it becomes a literacy class talk to the audience i know you cannot see the audience but audience can see you talk to the audience look at the camera and talk don't read yes sir next point i have is of course you don't have slide numbers right sir if you say we'll show the slide show again 
नहीं नहीं डोंट डोंट बॉदर यू डोंट गेट सच ए चांस व्हेन यू आर कॉम्पिटिंग रिमेंबर व्हेन यू गो फॉर ए जॉब व्हेन यू गो फॉर अ कॉम्पिट यू डोंट गेट टू शो एनीथिंग अगेन यस सर देन द इंट्रोडक्शन वाज टू लर्न वन ऑफ द टेक्निक्स ऑफ प्रेजेंटेशन इज either you say something interesting or get down to the problem immediately too long introduction don't talk about generalities don't talk about things which everybody knows focus on wo kitna first wave mein kya hua second wave mein we, we don't want history of corona in india we want what you have done and it takes so long next question i have is Do you know how a vaccine is tested? Sir, I am really not getting what exactly you are. Ah, see, you have now. talked about vaccine testing, vaccine efficacy, right? Yes, sir. So, how is what is the method of testing a vaccine? Who means you are saying that how many, which vaccine is more effective? Answer, that's it, na. whatever it is you talk don't ask me you have said you no, are sir, i'm i'm i mean aap kya matlab aap aapka kehna kya hai main wo janna chahta hu mera kehna ye hai ki aapko koi pata nahi hai ki vaccine ko kaise test kiya jata hai aapne kuch padha hi nahi uske bare mein boss sir padha uh, i have quite bit knowledge that uh, it is tested in three phases i guess Haan, i don't have proper knowledge but to it kya hota hai three phase mein kya hota hai थ्री फेज डिटेल का बात है भाई यू डोंट हैव एन आइडिया ऑफ हाउ ए वैक्सीन इज टेस्टेड व्हाट इज द डिफरेंस बिटवीन टेस्टिंग ए वैक्सीन एंड टेस्टिंग ए ड्रग सर टेस्टिंग अ ड्रग इज डन इन अ लेबोरेटरी नहीं नहीं ऐसे कैसे हो सकता है टेस्टिंग ए ड्रग भी पेशेंट पर ही करना पड़ता है सर पेशेंट मर गया था सर ऐसा है आपने ये बात पढ़ी नहीं भाई Sir, vaccine is like uh, it is first tested on laboratory animals. Then. अरे नहीं यार आप पढ़ा नहीं है तो पढ़ा नहीं मानो ना. Okay sir. Sorry. Why do you make up for this? So the sorry. point is whenever you start doing a project on the domain, कुछ तो पढ़ो उसके बारे में. ऐसा yes. मत समझो कि आप ब्रह्मपति और सब जानते हो. नहीं sir नहीं sir अभी कुछ भी नहीं आया. हाँ तो आपने पढ़ा नहीं है ना. तो मैं आपको बताता हूं बहुत फर्क है वैक्सीन टेस्टिंग में और ड्रग टेस्टिंग में ड्रग टेस्टिंग में ड्रग टेस्टिंग में ऐसा होता है कॉन्सेप्चुअली वो थ्री फेजेस वगैरह छोड़ दो अगर ब्लड प्रेशर का मेरे को बीमारी है हाँ और आप बोल रहे हो कि फलाना चीज ब्लड प्रेशर का मेडिसिन है तो कैसा टेस्ट करते हैं तो मेरा पहले ब्लड प्रेशर मेजर करेंगे देंगे और फिर देखेंगे ब्लड प्रेशर कम तो होता कि नहीं बिफोर एंड आफ्टर का डिफरेंस जो है उससे देखते हैं कि कोई इस ड्रग का इंफ्लुएंस इफेक्ट है कि नहीं वैक्सीन का वैसा नहीं कर सकते क्या क्योंकि किस, किसी को कुछ बीमारी हुई नहीं है सो दिंग सो इन वैक्सीन वॉट यूर टू डू इज फर्स्ट यू गिव द वैक्सीन टू ऑल दी पीपल एंड देन You have to challenge that vaccine. मतलब उस आदमी के सामने वो बीमारी होने की परिस्थिति पैदा की जाती है okay. जैसे समझो अभी आस्थमा का वैक्सीन है हाँ. हाँ? और मुझे आस्थमा होता है तो सबको मालूम है कि आस्थमा बरसात के दिनों में होता है पोलन ज्यादा हो तो होता है वगैरह तो पहले मुझे वैक्सीन देंगे और पोलन मेरे नाक पर छोड़ेंगे और देखेंगे आप अस्थमा अटैक आता है कि नहीं आता इसको बोलते हैं चैलेंज यस सर तो ऐसा कुछ पढ़ना पड़ता है वन ऑफ द मोस्ट सक्सेसफुल वैक्सीन इज पोलियो आप अगर पढ़ते ना थोड़ी हिस्ट्री तो बहुत इंटरेस्टिंग चीज आपको मिल जाती तो ये मेरा प्रॉब्लम है कि लोग प्रोजेक्ट करने लगते हैं उस विषय के बारे में जिसके बारे में उनको बिल्कुल कुछ भी मालूम नहीं है हाँ सर। ये आप ये प्रॉब्लम हो जाएगा आपका हाँ सर बिल्कुल सही है सर हमने गल, गलती सर हमने वो बैकग्राउंड मतलब उस जिस हम विषय में पढ़ रहे थे सर उस विषय में आराम थोड़ी जानकारी ले लेनी चाहिए थी तो ये आप अकेले नहीं हो मैं अगर दस पच्चीस लोगों का प्रोजेक्ट का इम्तिहान दू ना उसमें से चौबीस होते हैं जिन्होंने सब्जेक्ट के बारे में कोई चीज पढ़ी नहीं 
तो ये प्रॉब्लम है और इतनी न्यूज़पेपर्स में क्या दिया है सब दिखाने में लगता है कि ये लाइब्रेरी प्रोजेक्ट ही है लाइब्रेरी प्रोजेक्ट है तो शुरू से ही बताओ कि हमारा लाइब लेकिन एट ए वेरी लेट स्टेज इन योर प्रेजेंटेशन आप डेटा वेटा की बात करने लगे खैर तो बहुत सारे मैंने पूछे सवाल तो मैं अभी रुक जाता हूँ yes, थैंक यू सर आपने मतलब आपने टोके तो सर सीधे समझ में आई कि हमें हमारी क्या गलती थी क्या नहीं ओके थैंक यू सर नेक्स्ट फ्रॉम नेक्स्ट टाइम वी विल ट्राई टू गो विद परफेक्शन एंड विल ट्राई टू रीड अबाउट द बैकग्राउंड एंड स्टडी ये सिर्फ आपके लिए नहीं हो रहा पूरा जो भी अभी सत्तर पचहत्तर लोग आ बैठे हैं सुनते हैं सबके लिए है yes sir. we are on the in the phase of learning and we are learning a lot from you sir thank you sir thank you sir we are delighted to have your guidance stories depicts the struggle and the hard work behind one's success with the same we have a very distinguished personality amongst us mr samadhan gubade sir I invite Master Pranav Kalnani to introduce our another guest for the day. Okay, am I audible? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Mr. Samadhan Gubade is an inspiring figure for the student community present in this workshop. He has about eight years of work experience. With statistical analysis and more than seven years of medical research experience in cosmetic trials and clinical trials, his responsibilities include development of statistical analysis plans, randomized sample size determinations, and statistical report production for phase one and phase four clinical trials for pharmaceutical and cosmetic domain trials. His skills also include statistical programming, SAS, R, project management. working within a cross functional team environment and a broad understanding of the domestic and international pharmaceutical and cosmetic development industry mr samadhan completed his bsc and msc from university of pune in 2013 soon after finishing his studies he has contributed a lot when he worked with different organizations his first organization where he worked as junior statistician was educe solutions private limited his contribution at the organization included performing statistical analysis as per the requirements to develop software providing all statistical and clinical knowledge to develop clinical and pharmaceutical domain software validating all statistical results with sas r and minidab software and much more from 2014 to 2021 he served as senior bio statistician at cytos at cytos statistical software and services private limited currently he is working with three organizations namely icon the clinical research organization public limited company as a senior statistician symbiosis international university as visiting faculty for value added course clinical trial and data analysis and he is also a phd student in the symbiosis international university mr samadhan is also well versed with computer skills and has done certification in different courses published his report in publications and presented number of papers in national and international conferences he has won and been awarded number of trophies won third prize in project completion arranged by science association in 2012 this is science parker award at cycle awarded as deserving needy and best student for the academic year 2010 and uh, these are just to name a few so your inspiring and successful career with so many achievements will help us to get you as a role model we are really happy to welcome you in the mystery session of the workshop thank you pranav i request sir to please take up the platform and share his glorifying story with us sir please yeah yeah sure so thanks for the introduction 
So hello, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon. So uh, are you going to share my slides or shall I uh, share from my side? Sir, as you see, we don't have your presentation. Uh, OK, fine. Yeah, I'll share from my side. So hello everyone. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. And I feel very privileged to get an opportunity to have a talk with all of you. And uh, you have already given the big introduction, so I'm going to talk about myself only. I have been told to narrate my success story before you all. And let me tell you, there is nothing very great as a success story, but it's a simple story of a very ordinary boy. And it's just a story of experiences, my failures, my attitude to life. And yes, all my dear friends, success is not the destination. It's a process of your life. So let me share my screen first so that you can see my slides. Just let me know if you are able to see my slides. Is it visible to all of you? Can you please confirm it once? Yes, yes. it is visible. Visible, sir. Okay, fine, sure. So let's begin. So first of all, uh, I would like to introduce myself. So my name is Samadhan Gubre and Currently, I'm living in Pune, but my native place is near uh, Pune Solapur district uh, boundary. And I'm from uh, farmers background family and my parents are farmer and I have two younger brothers and I have been brought up in farmers family uh, from a small village. And you must have heard about Solapur district and there is a shortage of rainfall and my family is completely dependent on farming. And uh, you may aware about like for farming, water is very essential and also, my parents are not educated, so even they're not understand. I mean, they do not understand which type of education I have taken and my two younger brothers also taken. So from childhood days, I faced a lot of hardships and there was no one to guide us. So we can call like there was no such vision as such. And so I completed my school education from first standard to seventh standard in a local village school in a Marathi medium. And then we used to go to school by walking around five to six kilometers daily at that time. And I was good in academics. And one of my school teachers told me about the Mahatma Gandhi Vidyalaya Uruli Kanchan. And he said that you can get admission there for eight standard. And if you are topper in the class, then you will get free admission or you will get free education for ninth and tenth standard, including hostel fees, then all the expenses as well. So this came to me as a first opportunity in my life. And I knew that if I want to break the chain of poverty and improve the condition of my family, then I should be the first one to break the barriers around me. And I took up this opportunity and I started work hard. And yes, this was my first success to get free schooling 10 till 10th standard. And I can say the same school shaped my future. I remember we used to wake up around 5 a.m. and then take a bath with cold water. So I learned lesson of discipline from my school and I will be always grateful to my school life. So I did uh, education till 10th at Mahatma Gandhi Vidyalaya and then I got good score in 10th standard. And again, with help of my friends and few my senior uh, colleagues uh, as well as teachers, I started searching for a college in Pune because Mahatma Gandhi Vidyalaya is also uh, around 40 to 50 kilometers from Pune. So I was searching college for 11th and 12th in Pune and I got the admission in SSPMS college. That means Sri Shivaji Preparatory, Mil uh, Preparatory Military School and Junior College. But there was a question of hostel in front of me because I could not afford accommodation, including mess and other expenses in a city like Pune. So at the same time, I had heard about with the Tisayak Samiti Hostel from my seniors and started looking for it. So in spite of having good score, around 80% marks in a 10th standard, I did not get the admission in the first list, but I knew clearly that if I want to survive in a city like Pune, then I have to get admission here because with the Tisayak Samiti is highly prestigious as well as well-known hostel. And then for all other activities also, we have to pay very low fees. 
so and i heard uh, from my uh, friends as well like this money can be managed through online earn and learn scheme so hence i decided not to give up and again in the second round also i tried but i did not get the admission into the same hostel so i remember i visited the office several times for the admission because i wanted to get the admission in the same hostel so that i can survive as well as i can complete my education till the 12th and every time they used to discuss as well as ask questions like what is your uh, family background then what is your family income then do you have any relatives in pune if i said yes then the answer would be like then you can uh, adjust your accommodation in their uh, home as well as in their place so every time they used to ask questions and they used to write down some comments according to the discussion on my admission form and after several meetings as well as discussions there was no space left on my form on my form for any comments so finally hostel trustee told me that don't come again and go take the admission and i did so i used to manage my fees by doing the online earn and learn schemes um, then so i will count this as my second success in the same hostel duties were assigned to every student such as uh, helping in the kitchen then cleaning washrooms then yoga classes so i used to take a yoga classes in the morning uh, as a activity so i learned self discipline in the same hostel and i made good friends over there so i always remember uh, we used to work hard in the same hostel so i always uh, i would like to say like we used to work uh, for a part time job as well while working while doing a uh, uh, education so always remember a good company is important in your life also you can uh, take a part in a different activities as well so i completed 11th as well as <coughs> 12th education in the same hostel and after completion of 12th science i took admission for bsc in modern college pune and at that time i could not afford other courses because i mean i took admission for bsc because i could not afford other courses like engineering then medical etc so when i took the admission for bsc i had not decided specialization to the uh, study because we were not aware about the subjects like statistics mathematics i wanted to take chemistry so that i can get a job in a chemical laboratories or we can say in a chemical industries never thought of anything beyond this and that time i was afraid of mathematics numbers and all after second year of bsc i remember the most of the students uh, usually choose the subject in which they have good score in previous year and in my case as well my score was same for chemistry and statistics then the question in front of me like which subject should i choose for a final year either chemistry or statistics but what changed my mind was a simple stats project i did one project uh, while studying second year of bsc and i got the prize in second year of bsc in a statistics so my interest in stats developed from there and then i made a choice of statistics as my subjects and i decided to go with the statistics as a final subject for my uh, final year of the bsc you will be surprised uh, only two students including me took admission for statistics at that time and most of the students went for other subjects like mathematics physics chemistry biology botany zoology etc and the reason behind it was subjects were unaware about the scope of the subject that time we were not having idea about the statistics much but in recent years i can see that students are opting for statistics and many colleges have started new programs of bsc then msc in statistics data science and analytics so i think uh, two days back also we received one update from uh, professor dikshit from modern college i think they have started uh, one year full time course on data science so most of the course colleges have started new programs for bsc as well as msc so you are having multiple opportunities so you can take admission in multiple i mean you are having multiple opportunities so you can take the admission as per your suitable uh, suitability so work was and while doing the bsc i got opportunity to work in a, a principal sir's cabin under the earn land learn scheme so that i can manage some money for my education and the work was like data entry 
I used to check the emails. Then I used to check some university uh, related emails, then documents under the same scheme. So that helped me to complete my BSc. So I would really like to say thanks to teachers of Department of Statistics of Modern College and the principal sir of the same college who gave me financial as well as moral support and I could complete my graduation in a BSc in statistics. So the next question in front of me like what is next? after the completion of BSc. So after completion of BSc, I had no plans to, to study further because of fees and all other expenses. So I could not afford fee as well as accommodation. I was having some issues uh, related to the traveling and all. So I was thinking of doing a job so that I can help my two younger brother for their education. At the same time, while searching as well as while looking for a job, Principal sir gave me one opportunity to work in the office of joint director in education department section for minority scholarship section during the vacation. And after getting some amount of uh, money, again, I started thinking uh, of doing masters in statistics and there was very tough competition. But my teacher, including principal sir, trusted my hard work and gave me admission to the course that means for a MSc statistics and for fees also they give some concession because that time I was not able to uh, submit uh, I was not able to pay the full amount of uh, fees for the MSc statistics and seriously I mean if that time I would not have got this support I would have not completed my post graduation at the same time during the first year of my MSc my teacher, uh, Dr. Dixit sir, offered me work uh, as a part-time data analyst in the small firm. Uh, I used to go there after office, uh, after I used to go uh, this office uh, after college hours and used to work on a statistical analysis of data on various projects. So once while cleaning the office, we found some equipments like printers, laptops, and at the same time, we were very curious about the smart... Sorry. Okay. I think there was some disturbance. Okay, so I was saying like once while cleaning office, we found some equipments like printers, laptops, and the availability of such gadgets were very rare at the same time. Hence, I requested the employers where I was working to give me the laptop and deduct the money from my salary in monthly installments. So they gave me the laptop, then I repaired it and I learned multiple softwares like Minitab, MATLAB while doing the MSc. And using these softwares, I used to do all the practicals and I started playing with number. And this created the foundation for what I have learned in the college. So guys, always remember practical knowledge is very important. The basic concepts become clear through this. So I would suggest to work on practicals you can play with numbers you can understand the problem you can work on the objective as sir mentioned you have to see the background first you have to i mean you should try to understand the problem first you can play with the data and then you can conclude the results so basic concepts become clear through the practical knowledge only and marks are just a number but knowledge gives you the ability so finally i completed my msc and after completion of MSc, I started searching for a job. Then I joined one firm called Edu Solution as a junior statistician. And on the very first day of the job, I decided to quit the job because there were 30 to 40 software developers and programmers. And I was the only one statistician working as a junior statistician. And my role was to support software development team and for the same, they provided 15 to 20 reference books to me on the first day of my job. When I was under pressure, I kept patient and worked hard. And then eventually I started enjoying my job. So I worked over there for three to four months only. And then I started again bigger MNC like multinational company because I was hoping to get a job in a multinational company like Cytel, Icon, IQA. And at that time, my dream was to join Cytel as a statistician as my seniors were working there. 
and here comes the entry of a person in my life to whom i will be always grateful so because of i mean because my success story would not complete without him and fortunately the same person is with us and the name of the same person is dear dr anil gore sir so dr anil gore sir is my mentor and guide so i remember my interview when when i was when for the interview in cytel company i was not good in english communication and most of the questions answered i mean i answered most of the questions in a marathi language so that time sir checked our technical skills our passion to learn new things and offered me this opportunity and i took up this opportunity and my cytel's journey started from here so but at the same time i would like to give you one advice to work on your english communication skills so it is as it is very important to deal with non indian clients because while working as a statistician you have to deal with multiple clients like us uk europe you may get a chance to work with indian clients as well but while working with non indian clients the communication skills should be required i personally faced a lot of difficulties initially when i joined cytel and to improve my skills i mean communication skills i used to read english newspapers then listen to client recorded calls multiple times to understand their accent then used to read english books then used to watch movies with english subtitles so in cytel's journey one benefit was grooming my personality and my technical and communication skills were en- enhanced due to different activities and i got the opportunity to work in a csr team so what is csr team so csr means corporate social responsibility team that usually conduct different activities in various i mean in different colleges and uh, cytel usually conduct activities and they usually provide scholarships to the msc as well as bsc statistics students so i think uh, in recent years they are providing scholarships for msc statistics students so you can also reach out to the cytel and you can check if you are eligible then you will also get the scholarship for your higher education that means for msc statistics so definitely you should check with cytel for the for the process so that you can get a scholarship so during work breaks i love to spend time in trekking uh, in taking part in marathons then adventure activities then painting drawing cooking as well as in photography so that's all about me and i would like to mention one incident in my life so one day while walking through the streets of pune in the morning suddenly i noticed one house and i read the board and house belong to dr pv sukatme so do you know who is dr pv sukatme can anyone tell me about him have you heard this name Uh, Indian so I just have heard his name, but not aware of his uh, abilities and success. Sir, he has some work in agriculture statistics. Right, right, right. Yes, you are correct. So, if you get a chance to work on the same, I mean, you can read about. Um, I mean, read on the same. So, one of the greatest and eminent statistician of India, and I was really amazed to see his house in Pune. the house was such great per- the house of such a great personality in pune but i found it is not at all prominent okay so the board of name is very small and i felt that i should do something for it and this is heritage place for us and i discussed with my friends as well as with my colleagues and we went to historical place foundation which is a branch of kesari newspaper and they asked us to gather information about dr pv sukatme so we gathered information through internet then newspaper articles then we found some information in different books then we took some interviews and we tried to at that time we tried to connect uh, with pv sukatme's son as well we took some interviews and after getting some information we submitted a summary to the foundation uh, historical place foundation and i am very glad to tell you that the institute agreed our classification of dr pv sukatme's house as a historical place 
and organized need for a ceremony for it. So I will show you the picture of the same house in next slides. And I feel fortunate that I could be the part of this small step to recall the great scientist of India. So in my professional life, I enjoyed working at Cytel for uh, oh, say 1.5 years. And then I decided to seek a change to get a wider exposure in a clinical research field. So as you said in my introduction part, so recently I joined ICON Clinical Research Organization as a senior statistician, which is the top five clinical, which is in the top five clinical research organization worldwide. And also under the guidance of Dr. Gore sir, recently I took admission for PhD at Symbiosis International University. And overall, I can say I was the first in my family to be the change. And now my two younger brothers are also well educated. One is working as a senior engineer in large MNC and other one uh, secured all India rank 70 in gate 2020 exam. So on the uh, same, he got multiple offers from NPCI like Nuclear Power Corporation India Limited, then NTPC Nuclear Thermal Power Corporation, then ISRO. But he decided to go for higher education and currently he's studying uh, EMTech in IISC Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore. And so this was all about me and I'm still have a list of short term as well as long term goals in my life. And for that, I have to work hard as I think, I mean, little progress in each day adds up to the big results. So thank you so much for all your patience. And I know my story was not an extraordinary one, but I hope it has touched to some corner of your heart. So, I mean, thank you. So that's all about me. And in next slides, I will talk about work experience and I will give brief idea about what and all courses are available for statistics students and the opportunities in a clinical domain. So about work experience, uh, you have already introduced. So education qualifications. So I did a master's in statistics in 2013 and I'm having total eight years of experience in the same field. So you can just note down these things like I am extensively trained in the following like in post to study as well as statistics brief. So what is study as well as statistics brief? So usually client send us a one pager or two pager document and on the basis of same we have to think which type of statistical technique we can apply and then on the basis of study design. I mean on the basis of study objectives and design we have to prepare a statistical analysis plan which includes all the details about the statistical analysis. Then randomization techniques, sample size estimation, then SAP writing, <coughs> then blind data review. So in blind data review, we usually check the quality of the data <coughs> and full statistical analysis report. Then I'm having exposure on data mining, SAS, then R, then data science, and then I got a chance to work on one AI platform, that means artificial intelligence platform. And then I got a chance to work on some exploratory kind of analysis. And I would like to mention one thing here. So I got a chance to work as an on-site statistician at R&D Center, Bangalore, Hindustan, Unilever. And regarding accomplishment, with help of Dr. Gore sir, uh, we could publish one paper in Current Science Journal. And uh, I presented one paper in the FUSE EU Amsterdam conference. And as I mentioned earlier in my hobbies, music, travel, trek, explore, running, cooking, as well as I would like to participate in some social activities. So this one is my office. So in the pandemic, company offered us to work from home facility. <coughs> and I have this office at my home. So this one is the picture of my office home. And these are some snaps from different marathons where I enjoyed the marathons. Then these are some paintings as well as pencil sketches I drawn in free time. Then there are some photographs I captured in free time. These are some snaps where we participated in the CSR activities. Then we participated in fun activities in uh, parties arranged by the 
office team lunch and these are some pictures where i got a chance to present my paper at amsterdam europe and last year i got married to priyanka and uh, she is also mathematics professor and this one is the photograph of dr p v sukatme's house so the name is also interesting like sankhya darshan so statistics means sankhiki and uh, the board is given in the marathi like pune aitihasik vastu smruti historical place padma bhushan sankhya shastradnya dr pandurang vasudev sukatme son 19 11 to 1997 so son 1973 to 1997 so they were living here during this time okay so that's all about me uh, now let us move to the next slide like learning wheels so continuous learning so fundamental skills so if you are interested to join a clinical as well as some a data science industry then you should have some basic knowledge about the sas sas package that means statistical analysis system software as well as you should be able to play with the data with r package as well and if you are aware about the sas then it will be also good for you at least you should have some knowledge about sas and r because sas is certified as well as approved by us fda united states food and drugs administration so if you are interested to work as a biostatistician in a clinical field then sas knowledge should be there and r is a open source so you can use r for your project as well and if you get a academic copy of sas then you can start working on sas as well and online courses so you can do online courses uh, through uh, different platforms so these are the platforms available for doing online courses and you can do courses uh, and the courses are available uh, free i mean the free courses are available on udacity then edx i mean edx then coursera then udemy then on linkedin learning also there are multiple courses available then medium then uh, skillshare so these are the online platforms where you can do your online courses for the learning purpose then this is just a user interface for the udacity you just have to enter the course name like data analyst then you can search courses covered under data 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 science and then according to your interest and according to your level i mean beginner intermediate complex you can select your course for the learning then nowadays everyone is using mobile so the mobile apps are also available udacity udemy edx then coursera okay so you can just install the app and you can start learning courses on your mobile as well so apart from this you can get connected through uh, these two platforms like townscript and meetup this is just user interface for the townscript you just have to enter the course of the name i mean name of the course data science i have entered then you can select a city of you can uh, i mean select the city i have selected pune and then you can filter out the data like uh, i would like to go with free courses so these are the courses available for this topic data science data science courses july 4th to november 30 then data science with python then data science course in hyderabad okay and these courses are free so you can select the courses and start learning and about soft skills as i mentioned earlier uh, you can i mean you should focus on your communication skills to exchange the information and when you when you enter into the industry then english communication should be there and be proactive while working on particular project while working on your uh, i mean when you are doing college level project or if you are entering into the industry uh, be proactive and under the soft skills i would like to mention uh, one thing like work smarter before harder 
and uh, focus on the most important things the client needs or we can say in your case your teacher is your client so if you are working on a project then focus on the most important things that the your teacher as well as your colleagues need then develop production methods that are efficient other than regular methods then often efficient means being innovative and learning new methods then use right tools for your project for your project and for your analysis then important one is like maintain a healthy body so that's all about soft skills as well as uh, uh, online courses i would like to uh, take you through some opportunities in the clinical research and i think in next 3 to 4 minutes we'll cover the same so these are the roles available in the clinical domain consultant you can play a role of consultant then you can play a role as a statistical trainer then statistician bio statistician then statistical programmer if you are interested to do programming then you can work as a statistical programmer then clinical research associate but i think for clinical research associate you may need to do few additional courses regarding clinical domain then clinical project manager then data manager and drug safety associate i think for drug safety associate also you may have to search for some additional courses to work as a drug safety associate in a clinical industry so what is pharmaceutical industry it develops medicines and pharmaceuticals in the, i mean it is a successful as well as growing industry and pharmaceutical uh, industry uh, includes like pharmaceutical then biotechnology as well as medical device products and usually it called it as a contract research organization so icon cytel iqr these are the contract research organization and why to join pharmaceutical industry because large variety of large variety of work is available in the pharma industry then excellent career growth is there in the pharma industry then attractive salaries offered so i think uh, for freshers they are offering 3 to 3.5 lakhs package at initial level so attractive salaries they usually offer so that's why we can choose pharma industry as your career path and these are the companies you can have a look at the same like accenture then astrazeneca biocon cadila cognizant cipla where you can get a job as a statistician or a bio statistician or a programmer so you can see icon is also there then merck then pfizer then roche then ranbexy then ppd novartis no no disk then glenmark gsk pharmaceutical so you can just at least start looking profile of the same pharmaceutical company you can start reading material about lily then you can start reading material about dr reddy's so you can get idea like what they actually do this one is the list of top 10 cros as per the 2018 data lab corp then iqia sinos health then paraxel then pra health science then ppd then charles river then icon and then uh, nine puxc aptec then med pace so after completion of your masters you have to search you have to give your application for job in these cros and these are the well known cros and you can apply in these companies for the job and what is the basic requirement to get a job uh, in a pharmaceutical industry so if you are interested to work as a statistician then msc or phd in statistics is required and you should have good knowledge about statistics and as i mentioned earlier basic knowledge about sas and r should be there and if you are interested to join as a sas programmer then in that case usually have at least bsc in statistics i mean graduation is also sufficient for the sas programmer role mathematics computing or any other degree with a high level numeracy is required for the same so that's all from my side thank you for your time and your patience so if you have any questions i'll try to give answers
to your questions uh, in the same session or we can connect through email or phone as well. Does anyone have a question for sir? I guess not. So your story is indeed very motivating. We have so many lessons and teachings to take from your journey. It was very encouraging knowing how you overcame all the difficulties and hardships you faced, with the family backgrounds you came from, and how you worked hard and disciplined yourself through all this. We are really blessed. We are really blessed to get to know your story. I thank you wholeheartedly on behalf of everyone for this valuable talk. Thank you, sir, for sharing the struggle and your success with us. I'm sure many would have known the importance of working hard and achieving heights. Competition is always a good thing. It forces us to do our best. Here's the most awaiting one for you, Start Star, to make you feel the sense of being the best while appear for something every time. Here I invite Dr. Jyoti Shivalkar, ma'am, to please take up the platform for the same. Thank you, Ria. Uh, uh, dear participants, uh, I am within five minutes. This is 3.25. At 3.30, I am posting the link of Start Star Problem Solving Competition in the Telegram group of Star, uh, Start Star Competition. There is a Telegram group specially prepared who have registered for Start Star Problem Solving Competition. So you can log off from this program and those who are here who want to appear for that examination within five minutes i'm posting the link in that particular group the paper will be for 45 minutes time given will be 45 minutes and the marks total marks will be 40 marks okay so i think ria you can declare that the program here today's day one program is over and those organizing students also if you want to participate in the stat star competition you can log into your telegram group okay thank you ma'am it's hard to say goodbye to the people you stay with even after a small meet but goodbyes are always meant to meet again here we sign off from our day one to the workshop and we'll see you all tomorrow for day two have a nice day